Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 13, Episode 97. He's Dave Brian. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Wednesday. Steelers Nation marching right along as we get close to the start of the new league year. Pro Day's happening. First one was yesterday. Uh, franchise tag deadline yesterday as well. And later on in the show, we'll have Joe Clark and Jonathan Hightrader, who were both at Indianapolis for the 2023 NFL Combine, did a tremendous job. We'll talk to them and get their thoughts on their experience at Indy. But Dave, how you doing? Doing good. Boy, a week from today, right? Uh, by by Monday, once the uh, uh, legal tampering portion of the offseason gets underway, uh, this thing's going to really start ramping up quick. We still don't really have a lot of you know, news, news Steelers related to, uh, uh, to pass along. I guess that's a good and a bad thing. You see some of these other teams, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in the media with questions and concerns and stuff like that. And, you know, it's been relatively quiet for the Steelers overall, but that's obviously going to change here pretty soon. I don't know when we're going to get restricted, uh, tenders here last year, I think it was a day or two before the start of the new league year. So I'm not so quite sure we'll know about those tenders by the end of the week. Hopefully we do. And I, you know, as far as cuts go, the Steelers seem to like to wait till the last minute uh, on, on, on those as well, too. So uh, just kind of hoping that we'll start seeing the news wire pick up uh, from the Steelers uh, between now and, and obviously Monday when things get busy. And uh, yesterday was obviously a big day in the NFL as it was a uh, uh, tag deadline day. And tag you're at Lamar Jackson. Now, Pittsburgh, obviously not using the franchise tag on any player. That was fully expected. I do want to talk about some other Steelers stuff later in the show, including my free agency wish list for the, the Steelers offense. But I think we have to start with the big news of the day in, around the AFC North and around the NFL in general in quarterback Lamar Jackson being tagged with the non-exclusive franchise tag. We knew he was going to get tagged, provided there was not going to be a long-term deal, which I uh, really had no chance of happening before yesterday's uh, deadline. It was a question of what kind of tag would they apply, the exclusive tag or the non-exclusive tag. It was the latter. And talk about rabbit holes we could go down when it comes to Lamar Jackson's future, what teams could be involved, what teams seem to be out right now. There's a, a lot of conversation to be had. And I know that's not directly Steelers related, but just given the importance of, you know, whenever he's healthy and playing one of the top quarterbacks in football, potentially going somewhere else or certainly having an uncertain future with where he'll play in 2023. Um, I know you have a lot of thoughts here, Dave. So just kind of give me your thoughts on this Lamar Jackson situation. Yeah. I, you know, and did, I obviously don't know how this thing is going to play out. Uh, and, and we've had a few conversations along the lines of what, you know, what are they going to do with, with Jackson? Will they get him signed before they have to use e, e, you know, any of the tags and all like that? Now that we know the route that they've taken with the non-exclusive tag, uh, I think they made the right decision here uh, mm -hmm. personally. And it feels like uh, Eric uh, DaCosta uh, has take, is, is playing a very calculated uh, game of chicken here. Uh, and, you know, and, and one that I think, that they have gone into this thinking that even if Lamar Jackson winds up signing an offer sheet with another team, they fully intend to match it. Uh, now, there are scenarios that teams could come up with that would make it very, very hard uh, for them to, to match. A would be to severely overpay uh, market value. Uh, I think even if the market value is is within reason on an average yearly value, and even if the the whole thing was fully guaranteed, assuming it's not like eight years, you know, fully guaranteed type deal, I still think they 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 would match it there. I I just think this is hey. You know, you don't like what we've been trying to work with you on here to try to get this deal done. Uh, go out and 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 
let yourself see what the market is, bring us back the best deal. And if the market dictates that that's the best deal, uh, we'll match it within, you know, within reason here. So I, I really think this was a calculated move and look, Lamar Jackson's represented himself. That's, that's going to make this a challenging situation, uh, here, but I really think that the Ravens have looked at this and say, we know what your market value is here. Even if it is fully guaranteed, if another team says that, 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 your market value is a fully guaranteed deal here. Once again, I'm not talking about eight years. I'm talking about five years or fewer here. Then we'll fully, you know, we'll match it here. And if for some reason we, we can't or won't, you know, a consolation prize of, 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 of two first round picks isn't awful, even though, you know, you're, you're essentially blowing up, you know, uh, the quarterback position, or you mm-hmm. would be uh, in, in that situation here. Uh, I, I applaud them here. And then obviously now we're going to get into the talk of, you know, immediately all these reports come out from, from, from these various beat writers who cover teams that saying, well, the Falcons aren't going to be interested in, in, in Lamar Jackson, the, the Raiders, the, the, the Washington commanders. I mean, uh, go down the list already. Uh, of, of, of teams that, you know, did this come that that's where the argument is going to be here. Did uh, uh, these reports that surfaced almost as quickly as I could get downstairs, uh, you know, to, 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 to cook my lunch and back up, you know, to, to automatically come out with these teams, you know, supposedly not going to be interested in Jackson. Then you have what what ended up happening happening on on social media yesterday. Uh, all former players and other players and analysts are saying, "Oh, this is collusion and all like that." I get why that is happening. I get why the talk of that, especially the way this kind of played out uh, uh, with with so many teams supposedly or reportedly not going to be interested. But I there's and nobody likes popping on the tinfoil hat as much as I do. But I, I and and will there eventually the NFLPA come out and file a grievance to say this was collusion on the owner's part because of the guaranteed contract and this was just a whole ploy to make the Deshaun Watson contract an outlier from here on out? I I I, I can't get myself there yet, but uh, I do think the Ravens made the right decision here. Look, I had, what if they had, had worked out a deal with him last minute, five years, fully guaranteed $50 million. The talk right now would be, man, how could they do that? I guarantee mm-hmm. you that would be because there, there's so many people that want to take the, the, the other side of the argument, whatever, whatever it is that that would be the talk right now. I can't believe fully. He's not worth fully guaranteed, but now that that hasn't happened, that they've exposed him to the entire league. Uh, we're getting the other side of that. Uh, that is, uh, oh, well, this is, this is how, you know, this is, this is going to be collusion here. But that's that's where I stand on. I think they made the right decision here. My gut, for whatever that's worth, tells me he's going to be in Baltimore in 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 2023. Yeah, I basically echo your thoughts. And I wasn't I really I'm still not 100 percent sure how the situation will go down going forward. But I was pretty confident they were going to put the non-exclusive tag on Jackson yesterday, just as you said, to say. All right, let's see what the market really says about you, Lamar Jackson. You want fully guaranteed. We didn't want to do that. Let's see what the other 31 teams think about you and your value. And we'll you know, determine that whenever uh, you get some offer sheets, assuming you get some offer sheets. And right now, we're not even sure if that's that's going to happen. But I think that was the, the right calculation by the Ravens. When it comes to the talk of collusion, you can see what's kind of maybe happening here. But I just, when people ask me about that, I say two things. Good luck proving that and good luck punishing that. I don't know how you, you know, logistically the NFL or the union will go around and try to do that unless there's some sort of smoking gun in a combine, you know, smoke filled back room about Mohaha, we're going to, you know, screw Lamar Jackson out of this situation. I doubt you're going to find that. And so I don't think that's um, going to be an avenue that's going to end up becoming super relevant. But it is interesting. I mean, it, is the, the the lack of teams who seem interested in Jackson solely because of the fully guaranteed thing and they're just want to, 
the, the owners don't want to set this precedent of giving out fully guaranteed contracts. Here's my thought that, that I was thinking about. If there was one team out there right now, Alex, who thought, you know what? If I signed, if I could uh, wrestle away Lamar Jackson from the Ravens for, uh, let's say, $47 million on a five-year deal, fully guaranteed, and I think I can win two Super Bowls in the five years with him, you telling me there's not an owner out there that would jump at that? With, yeah. with, with some of these teams, if they truly thought this guy, I can win one or two Super Bowls in the next five years, and all it's going to cost me is, uh, what did I say, the number forty-seven million, fully guaranteed over the next five years. I'll take that. I'll take that bet. You know, yeah. and and, and, heck, and you all it even, takes is one, one owner right. to do that. And you could do even a, a three-year deal fully guaranteed, a Kirk Cousins type deal, which wouldn't really be precedent changing. It's an offer sheet. He doesn't have to take it, but you can submit the offer sheet and see what he wants to do about that. Three years at 50 million per year, 150 guaranteed. I mean, you could do something like that. But are, but are, are we also saying that no team legitimately has interest in Lamar Jackson in a quarterback star world where Daniel Jones just got you know 40 million per year? There's no interest in bringing Lamar Jackson on board. I think where people are raising the red flags here and, and, and I don't know the answer to this, but you know, were these teams all, you know, these reports that came out instantly on Twitter, are those deliberately planted by other teams right away? Or are these just reporters saying, well, don't look for the Falcons to do it, you know, and don't look for the rate. In other words, and, and we'll never know. Uh, I mean, do was it, is this calculated? Do are these reports that came out right on Twitter directly from the team timed up right this way? You know, and good luck proving it if it is. Right. But uh, I, to me, it just feels like all these different beat reporters want to get a jump on things and and say, look, there's 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 no way uh, this this is going to happen now. Uh, you know, weren't weren't the Cleveland Browns supposedly out of Deshaun Watson? Right until from, they weren't until yeah. they, until they weren't, you know, will we get to some point where uh, one of these teams or at least explore uh, having talks, you know, with, with, with Lamar Jackson, I guess I suppose if he goes throughout this entire process here and nobody even picks up the phone to call him, then, then maybe that makes the grounds of, of the collusion aspect, you know, that much more greater and all like that. But I truly think if there was a team out there right now, an owner that said, man, are you telling me all that, all that's going to cost me is two first round picks and a five year, $48 million per year contract to get this guy. And I, I think I can win two Super Bowls with him. That, that on March 15th, I'd have an offer sheet in front of, or, you know, that owner would have an offer sheet in front of Lamar mm -hmm. Jackson. Yeah, I mean, you would think on paper because somebody's going to offer right. Winning, winning trumps whatever the the uh, whatever the uh, the league mantra is. Well, we got to band together here. We got to get these mm -hmm. these fully guaranteed. Uh, we got to make this Deshaun Watson contract really seem an outlier here. Uh, everybody with me? Yeah, <laughs> but but but. You can't tell me that there's the one guy thinking, you know what? If I won, if I won two Super Bowls with L L Lamar Jackson, what would that do to to the value of my franchise mm -hmm. and how much more money? Because it's all about money, right? Sure. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to think some team will will come in eventually. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think when it comes to the reporting, you know, minutes after the the tag was applied about this team's out, that team is out. Atlanta, Miami, Carolina, et cetera. Yeah, I, I assume that teams anticipated this was coming, coming off the combine. People talk, agents talk, teams talk, and they probably all knew Jackson's going to get tagged, probably not exclusive. What do we want to do as a team? And so they kind of already had these thoughts and conversations and decisions uh, in place. I don't think this news caught any team or anybody really all that off guard. So I think it's kind of why the, the reaction came out so swiftly after the official tag deadline. But it'll be interesting because right now, I mean, how does he end up going back to Baltimore then? Let's just, let's just assume that no other team comes in and it's just Baltimore. He has he, he will have to sign the tag whenever he wants to. He don't he, have to. He, oh, yeah, as Le'Veon Bell showed. But 
um, the balls in his court in that sense is what I'm trying to say is that he, you know, he does not have to sign the tag right now and can take his sweet time. So it's not like, you know, Baltimore is in control here to an extent, but so is, is Lamar. So how does that play out? Put again, let's assume for a second, no other team gets involved. How does, how do things play out just within Baltimore? Well, I would think at that point he would need to look at. I would imagine that their best offer is 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 a lot more average yearly value than 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 the non exclusive franchise tag. Oh yeah, because this is only what thirty two million by right. quarterback money. That is cheap. Right. Uh, so I, I think when he when he comes back, it would the discussion goes. Look, we we told you this was was the best offer uh, here, whatever it is, as far as guarantees. And I would um, I would like to think that it would make him somewhere in the top five highest paid quarterbacks at that time. I would think, uh, and then he would just go about you know crossing the T's and dotting the I's and getting that deal done. At, at, at some point, uh, I'll, I'll say this. I don't foresee Lamar Jackson playing on a thirty two point four one six million dollar uh, uh, tag in in, in in 2023. I would just think that if he has to come back uh, with with no signed offer sheets in hand, uh, that that in good faith, the, the Ravens would leave their best offer still out on the table. And then at that point, he would he would take that offer. Well, yeah, I'm going to say he's not going to play on the the non-exclusive tag number, but also, I mean, obviously he rejected their best offer. Now, he may realize and say, well, that's the only offer that I have, but it's an offer he clearly does not like. And so he doesn't want to play on the tag, doesn't want to play with that last offer. There's nothing, I guess, really stopping him from just, you know, leveraging and saying, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to sign either of those things. Give me a better offer. I mean, he could have that leverage he could pull if he wanted to. Sure. Uh, look, he's probably got enough money in the bank now that he can say, I'm, I'm not going to play, you know, yeah. uh, and, and, and until I get what I want. And, and, and it screws Baltimore because they have that cap charge. They have to account for that, right? Sure. That 32 million because right. they can't because he could in theory, in theory sign that at any point And that, that you know, be, is, is on the books. Right. And they obviously aren't going to pull it. Right. You know, or at least you wouldn't think that that, that they right. would. So it would get it. Now, look, they would get that credited back by week as the season went along, just as the same way Levy, uh, Le'Veon Bell and the Steelers, right? But right. even so, the Steelers had to, uh, you know, throughout free agency and through just throughout the start of the year, uh, that that that's a that's a that's a chunk of money to have on right. your cap there that you're that, that you can't do anything with there that becomes some, some sort of a roadblock and look to some degree, this is going, this, this is going the, the longer this takes to play out with Lamar Jackson, you know, it, 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 it is tough for the Ravens to have to work around this because they already, you know, we're, we're, we're not in a very favorable now, look, can they, are they going to have to restructure some contracts or weren't, were they going to probably a cut a few of these players coming up as well too? Absolutely. But there's still, you got $32.416 million with one guy uh, in cap space still on the books that you have to wait for this game of chicken to play out with. Right. It's a giant anchor around you and, and, and bell wasn't 32 million. It was a big amount of money, but it wasn't 32 right. million like Jackson is. And it isn't that quarterback with running back. You can kind of manage that better with Baltimore. It's, it's the money. And then the uncertainty of who's our quarterback for 2023. How do we handle this with a draft free agency, Tyler Huntley, all those kinds of things that you have to think about and consider, because you're not quite sure what, what Jackson is doing. All of that is to say that, you know, Jackson has leverage here to try to still work out a deal because if he doesn't want to play on the tag, doesn't want to play on the offer that Baltimore has, he doesn't have to. And he can kind of make that life difficult for Baltimore in this, as you said, game of chicken. Right. And look, he could, you know, if he doesn't get an offer sheet that he likes to and wants to sign or something like that, he could he could obviously uh, play this out through the draft and say, OK, you know, you want to play chicken? Uh, let's see what you do at the quarterback position in the draft. Or, or do you really like uh, uh, Snoop Huntley, you know? Right. Yeah. And I mean, there are there are so many other possibilities, obviously, with the non-exclusive tag. If teams want to put in an offer sheet, they got to give up their first round pick this year, their second or, their, or excuse me, their first round pick this year and the first round pick next year. But then if it goes after draft, then teams theoretically like San Francisco, Miami could jump in. There could be sign and trade scenarios that could be played out that kind of doesn't have to, you know, uh, tie themselves to the to the uh, compensation formula of the, the non-exclusive franchise tag. So 
this thing could still go in different directions. I, I, again, I think he probably stays in Baltimore, but you can't tell me that that not one team's going to show interest in Lamar Jackson over these next couple of months because he's Lamar Jackson. It's a quarterback starved league. Somebody's got a cave at some point, you would think. Uh, yeah, you would think. But, I mean, stranger things have happened. He, 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 here's the thing. You know, people say, well, why wouldn't they just go ahead and give him the exclusive tag uh, and, and you know, that way not expose him and all like that? But, well, once you do that, then it puts even more leverage in Lamar's category because then he's sitting at a 40-something million dollar cap number, right, uh, that, that you have to work around. Yeah, and you're still in this position a year from now if you can't get a deal done in right. terms of trying to do and, and then, and then, you, then you tag him again right. 120 percent and it's 50 million or something like that. Right. Then then you're working out. You're already maximizing what he could potentially earn in that scenario on multiple tags. Yada yada. Uh, so he is he 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 does have more control. And once again, I I and I you know I don't want to turn this into Ravens Depot or whatnot, but uh, uh, I I I I I think. It's a very calculated move on on the Ravens' behalf here, and my gut tells me that that Lamar will wind up coming back and then taking their best offer. Okay, I was going to ask you how you think this thing plays out. Let me ask you a slightly different version of that question: Is as the salary cap CBA kind of nerd expert you are, how interested are you in this situation kind of just given all the variables and components and uncertainty of it it seems it seems pretty pretty interesting just from a contractual logistical standpoint yeah look i mean it's it's very interesting i I will say this you know and and i'm not surprised with all the former players and current players coming out and uh collusion and all like that how about negotiate a better cba guys Mm -hmm. you know uh you know, and here's the thing, uh, uh, even the, whenever this, you know, when th- this current CBA ends and the next one starts getting negotiated, it's not like you're going to make hands, hands over fists uh, gains that that next time. Uh, if they are, if the NFL PA and the players uh, are, are, are really concerned about future players, then they need to start have a goal set to get more and more concessions each time that helps the guy 25 years from now because they're mm-hmm. not going going to benefit and i think the i think the that, that's the, a hard sell though sure not going to help you guys it'll help the guys 20 years from now next and generation look, and look the and, and as hard light we see it every time negotiation we're going to hard line this and and save your money and all like that that's all fine and good for 20% of the of the players that make a you know that that are on their second contracts and have a lot of money in the bank but what about the 80% that man i just want to get to a second contract i can't afford to lose a year of my uh of my life and, and and a year of possible playing time, uh, and a year of pay more, even even if it is at minimum uh, here, I, I I can't afford to do that. So that's why when you get to crunch time, you have the eighty percent having the louder voice because they say, "Man, we just want to play, man. I I I you know I I I need that uh, uh, seven hundred and whatever thousand dollars this year, you know, because I I might not get another year of it uh, there. I think the main goal for the for 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 the players. Next time around is 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 trying to eliminate the tag, you know, but even so, a lot of those guys look at it. Well, that's only one player uh, possible per, per team, you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, but, you know, but that the give and take of getting the, 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 the franchise tag to go away. I'm sure the owners would say, OK, you want the tag to go away? Well, we want every player uh, drafted to be under our control for five years, or you have to have five years credited service because before you can become an unrestricted free agent. See, they're, they're not just going to give it away. Right. You yeah. know? And, and, uh, and to your point, whatever, whatever they give up, l- losing the tag affects about 1% of NFL players, whatever they, the union would have to give up to get that would affect 99% of the players. And so there wouldn't be an appetite for that. I don't think. Yeah, look, I mean, how many players even received the tag this year and the tag's in place? Right. <laughs> you know? Sick. I think it was six. Right. So less you than one percent, point oh one percent. 
But at least that's an avenue of leverage that they would take away in that aspect. I mean, good luck getting a game. You know, hopefully they and, and I, look, I am very pro player. You know me. I, I you know, mm-hmm. but I do see both sides of this here. Uh, good luck on getting it. They're going to have to get into the owner's pocket pretty deep by canceling a season or two or something like that uh, before they're they're going to be able to break this thing and, and, and get fully guaranteed contracts. Now, might they slowly be able to start getting, you know, the second round or the third round guys, maybe fully guaranteed first. Maybe that's an option there, but uh, uh, look, they signed off on the CBA, man. That's, you know, and you know, once that happens, uh, I, I, I have to stop fighting for the players until the next time around uh, comes for them to start negotiations again in my, in, in, in my own personal head. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that fight's over. The The CBA has been signed. Nothing you can do about it until the next uh, until it expires and next negotiation begins. And yeah, I'm with you. I mean, you know, I, I would love players and I support players getting fully guaranteed sure. contracts. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. But I mean, I'm all for that, you know, because I want players to get paid. The owners are going to be fine. I want the players that actually do the work and risk their their, their health um, to get that money. But they're not on a track to, to do that. And look, every year, you know, every time the CBA is up and, and they start going into the negotiations, they got this war cry going and they're all pumped up. And then uh, they come away with it with like five strands of hair and then they <laughs> act like they got the whole scalp. Right. Yeah. You know, that happened in 2010. The, the right. players ran out of money and the NFL PA was screwed and they had to cave, basically. Right. Uh, so, you know, it. It's 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 up the NFLPA as you mentioned that we're talking about this at DMs probably needs new new leadership you know mm-hmm. uh, fresh fresh leadership there so and until they start uh, negotiating better on their side come to CBA time you know, they're, they're not gonna you and, and and then two years into it or three years into it four years into it you're gonna something like this is gonna come up with Lamar Jackson they're gonna scream ah oh, this ain't fair and the CBA is out of whack and this is just collusion it happens every time like this yeah and again with collusion I can understand the logical case for why there isn't interest in Lamar if that ultimately ends up happening and let's just say hypothetically no team puts in an offer sheet and there's really just no interest no appetite to uh, to try to you know get Lamar away from Baltimore but unless you have something that's text messages not I heard or they said you know nothing hearsay good luck proving it and how do you punish that I mean how do you punish when you're going to go punish the Raiders why didn't you put in an offer sheet for Lamar Jackson well we didn't want to well we're going to punish you no, they, they can't do that you can't justify that so um, I understand logically where people are coming from but you know almost legally it's not going to work all right all right so I'm sure people love the uh, the Ravens uh, heavy part but I think it's an interesting but that, conversation. that's what we do we have to address these you know, especially during this kind of slower time of the year right now you know that right. those are the it, it's a topical thing that uh look I got I've, uh, you know I've got two or three emails in the uh, email machine from people you know asking questions about the Lamar Jackson situation so yeah uh, some yeah. of you are interested in, in it we get it some of you are probably already fast forwarded through this portion we get it yeah and we're not exactly burying any big Steelers news had they had they signed cam sutton we would have talked about that first but there's really nothing to report right now in terms of the the news heavy side of things for the pittsburgh Steelers. as far as the daniel jones thing goes i I get it what they did there too allowed them to use a franchise tag on uh on on, on saquon barkley on top of it so they get to retain you know what what were your options there you know i suppose they could have put the uh uh you know non-exclusive on him keep the price down there i i just think they were in a situation uh, uh, a a newish kind of head coach who made made some ground uh last year you know kind of what are you what are your alternatives here you either uh tag this guy and 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 you know run the risk of 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 letting your top running back uh walk off you know to another team or something like that or or you do what they did but i always say too let's wait till we see the exact details of all these deals of the geno smith of the of the Derek cars of the uh uh of the daniel jones now look it does look like what 82 million fully guaranteed at least that's the reports which would be the first two years of daniel jones i mean good for him for getting that but on the flip side you know I, after two years here I would imagine the Giants have an out. So they are they are going all in on Daniel Jones essentially uh and Saquon Barkley and 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 Brian Dayball and they're thinking, look, we we can make this work and we can compete for a Super Bowl uh with this. Now will it play out that way? 
Uh, we'll see. But uh, but another takeaway is, you know, the, the middle class contract for a quarterback is pretty much gone now. You either decide that you want the guy and 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 you make him the top, you know, eight, nine highest paid quarterback in the league come time uh, or, you know, you, you move on from him. Yeah, thirty million is kind of like the floor to be a starting quarterback, not on a rookie contract in the NFL. So the price has really gone up. I, I mean, I I get why the Giants did what they did. They're kind of in a really tough spot, but I think they just kind of cemented themselves into quarterback purgatory of a good a good team, a wild card team, but not a team that's going to ever compete for Super Bowl so long as Daniel Jones is their quarterback. Okay. All right, let's get to some Steelers talk here and uh, free agency on the horizon. March 13th starts the legal tampering period. Wednesday, March 15th will start the, did I say March? I said March 13th, right? Uh, for the legal tampering period and then the 15th for the start of the new league year. And so I put together, as I do every single year, my wish list, uh, just the offense so far. I think by Friday's show, maybe by Friday's show, I'll have the defensive wish list uh, for us to talk about. But here for the Steelers offense, just some names that I think some players I like, some players I think are good fits, and some guys that aren't going to aren't gonna break uh, the bank. And so the number one player that I really would like this team to sign here in the offseason, um, and one that I think makes a lot of sense, is Zach Paschal, the wide receiver from Philadelphia. Versatile, cheap, has really had a lot of success against Pittsburgh. Kind of a thorn in their side. Three career games against the Steelers, three touchdowns, one in each of those three games, including a big touchdown he had against Philadelphia, uh, with Philadelphia against Pittsburgh. Um, in 2022. So that's a guy that's a good run blocker, a veteran type of guy, has some size, can play inside, play outside, should be a minimum basically type of deal. I think Zach Pascal makes a lot of sense. All right. And and that was going to be my next question is kind of where, where you see his value at, uh, you know, head, head, heading into free agency here. And he played, I think, for the minimum in Philadelphia this past year, coming off a decent 2021 with Indy, and he caught only 15 passes this year with the Eagles. It was kind of more of a special teams, you know, heavy, you know, bit piece in that offense. So, I mean, he should be like a million, basically a minimum contract again. All right. Uh, he's probably going to be attractive to several teams at that price, though, right? So uh, what 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 would be the max you'd be able, you would be willing to offer him on, say, a two or three year deal? Yeah, if you had to go multi-year, it wouldn't be much still. It might be $2 million, two years, $4 million. I mean, again, the, the production was super light. So, I mean, I don't think he's somebody that'll that'll break the bank. It's, I don't have the exact numbers on him, but okay. this guy played for Peanuts this past year, and his production went down. So I don't think his value is going to go up tremendously. All right, that would allow you to move on from a guy like Gunnar Olszewski or, or, or something like that, right? Yeah, I mean, they're a little different in terms of how they win. You know, Shevsky more return guy. Pascal's not going to really help you there. It's almost, you know, if you had, if you, if you lost Miles if you, Blake, or if you tendered a guy like Steven Sims, you could yeah. carry him through through camp and then 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 alleviate that that two million something charge. Yeah, I mean, you could still release Gunner for other reasons with Calvin Austin getting healthy, and if you tender Steven Sims, so I don't think I don't think Pascal's the guy that does that, but you could do that for some other reasons. But if Boykin were to walk for whatever reason, I think Pascal would be that special teams guy that could help kind of okay. replace that. That can play slot, can kind of be that bigger run blocker. Was a really good run blocker this past year, so it's almost kind of a Boykin type thing there. The other receiver I mentioned was Paris Campbell. That's going to be a, a more expensive type of guy, pedigree, big slot, um, kind of a yak threat, but has struggled to stay healthy and. Um, was kind of an underneath threat in that, you know, really miserable Colts offense this past year. So he's going to cost more. How much? I'm not 100% sure. Um, but if you want kind of, okay, here's our starting slot receiver and you're going to sprinkle Calvin Austin in, then you look to a Paris Campbell. Okay. Offensive line, though, I think is is where this team really has to to add some depth in for agency, some veteran type guys. And I've mentioned a couple of guys before in terms of veteran backup swingmen and None of these names are going to be great because, you know, the, the scarcity for offensive linemen in general is, 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 you know, so tough to find. And, you know, the guys that are good don't come cheap. And so in terms of backups, I'm thinking Cam Irving from Carolina, his relationship with Pat Meyer. He was with him in Carolina in 2021 before Meyer came over to Pittsburgh. Uh, coming back with Chris Hubbard, a reunion there, I think would make sense. A guy that's going to play tackle, a little bit of guard if you had to as well. Nick Allegretti from Kansas City. Um, Scott, some size, played center, played guard, more of an interior type guy, some tackles, the biggest name on that list they had. One we've heard before, Andre Dilliard from Philadelphia, former first round pick, Andy Weidel. There's that connection there from their time together with Philadelphia. And then Trey Pipkins, who quietly had 14 solid starts with the Chargers this past year. Another Pat Meyer connection. Meyer was with the Chargers in 2019 when they drafted Pickin, uh, Pipkins. 
in the mid rounds, he can play left or right tackle. So I think Pipkins is one name I've heard nobody talk about. And, you know, he may want to, you know, get paid and, and some, be a, a solid starter somewhere. But I think that's a name that people should at least get kind of familiar with. And I know these are all guys scheduled to be uh, unrestricted free agents. And I don't know what's going on out there in, 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 in San Diego. But what what what's going to happen to Matt Filer, San Diego, uh, Los Angeles? I'm, I'm caught in uh, <laughs> so, several years ago. Uh, uh, he's still well, under contract, right? I don't right. Know he's, he, he's, he's got one season left uh, for 2023 for uh, six and a half million uh, base salary. Is that? Is that too rich? Will that be too rich for them? Might, might you know? Might he become a casualty here? And and if if, if he is, is that someone you you'd consider? Yeah, I think certainly would consider that from his time with Pittsburgh. Yeah, that's a pretty heavy amount of money. I think he's had some injuries. I'm just trying to see what his uh, situation is. If anyone's kind of writing about that, it sounds like he could be a, a cut candidate. So that it's somebody saying here, he's likely a cap casualty. That's just one man's opinion, but it sounds like um, that he could become a free agent. So not included on that list, because like you said, unrestricted only, I, I was ascribing that to. Sure. But sure. Yeah. I think, yeah, that, that's a good name to mention. All right. And, and you would think if he is going to be cut, it would be this next week, right? Yeah, Unless, I would assume uh, they would do it before the start of the new league year. I mean, I, I suppose you could go through the draft and see what you get there if you're there and then say, okay, see ya, peace out, you know. But uh, uh, I wonder if, what is, let me look and see what is guaranteed, if he's got any. I, it doesn't look like any of that's guaranteed at all either. So okay, there's, so there's easy no, cut there. There's no roster bonus or anything uh, like that. Now, they would uh, they would have $2 million in, 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 in dead money, but uh, they would save $6.5 million prior to roster displacement. That's that's just somebody I thought about as you were running through those. And I, I quickly looked up his contract, and uh, 2023 is his final year at $6.5 million. And he hasn't exactly lit the world on fire, but he would have a price as a, as, as a potential – a uh, guy that you could probably throw in there and, and make compete with, 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 with Kevin Dotson, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, he's played left guard before he's kind of, kind of plays all over. Only, only thing he doesn't play is like center and left tackle. So yeah, I think left guard, if he wants to come in and compete, that actually makes a, a lot of sense. Who, who Who's your favorite guy of all these offensive linemen that you listed here? Well, I think Pipkins and is maybe the most talented in terms of like starter guys. And again, what that market will be, there's always that for agency tax, especially on offensive linemen, especially tackles. And so he might be a little, you know, too costly. I just, you know, I think a Cam Irving, just given the the versatility, I know that's not a, a sexy name and he was pretty bad in Cleveland to start his career. I think he's gotten better as he's gotten older and gotten away from the Browns and that whole mess that, that, um, you know, he, he walked into. So Anyone that's kind of that versatile veteran tackle at the least. I'm, and I'm, I'm not saying that you have to be content with your starting five. If you want to address this offensive line in terms of starters, you can probably more do that in the draft than you would for agency. But this team just needs some depth right now. They need some guys behind their starting five because they have nothing. And they cannot, as I said before, bank and bank on and assume that this starting five is going to be as healthy in 23 as they were in 22. All right. Tight ends and running backs. Yeah, just a couple of real dumpster dives here in Drew Sample from Cincinnati. Uh, Jesse James, another familiar name there, barely even played for Cleveland this past year. Kind of more, this would be if Zach Gentry were to leave, and I think he will resign. But if he were to go somewhere else, that is going to create that hole number two tight end. Someone mentioned Tyler Croft as well. He's got size and he's really an exclusive blocking tight end this past year. That's a name that I didn't put there, but probably should have put there in all honesty. And then running backs, again, this would kind of be only if and unless uh, Benny Snell were to leave and go somewhere else in Dontrell Hilliard from Tennessee and Travis Homer from Seattle, guys that have some size, special teams value, and should come pretty cheap. I imagine you got a lot of black in the comments and all like that. But once again, these are guys that are extreme, extreme lower end uh, uh, value type guys. Uh when it comes to, 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 to contract value, you, you, you didn't go for the, for the home run hit in any of these. Yeah. I don't expect this team to spend big on offense. They could spend more defensively just given some of the losses they may experience there. But again, I think their whole philosophy for this offense is keep that group intact. Maybe add some depth pieces through free agency, maybe add a starter or two or somebody that can contribute more heavily through the draft. I think this offense, you're not going to get any sort of big swing with an offensive free agent. Yeah, I imagine you turned a lot of people off <laughs> because, of, but I mean, that's how these try, always go. Yeah. We try to look at these as realistically as we can, right? 
Yeah, I mean, we, I could give you all the big names out there like everybody else, but you know, they're not going to sign, so it just wasted energy and breath. I think it's, it's more fun to look at those uh, economical names. I mean, and, and last year I talked about some bigger names. I talked about James Daniels, yeah. being one of the guys, and so whatever it warrants, I'll, I'll talk about the big names. And defensively, there'll be some bigger names on here than what the offense has, but um, still some some depth options that I think Pittsburgh should consider. Okay. All right, David, I think we'll take a pause here. I want to get to Jonathan Hightritter and Joe Clark to get their thoughts on the combine, about a 55-minute interview with those guys, their experience there with the interviews, talking to Omar Khan, talking to prospects. So we'll take a pause and come back with Jonathan and Joe. And welcome back to the Terrible Podcast. And as we mentioned at the top of the show, have on today Joe Clark and Jonathan Hightrader, our two guys who were at Indianapolis for the 2023 NFL Combine. Both guys did a tremendous job for Jonathan, his second year for Joe, his first time out at Indy. So I want to start with you, Joe, and you guys were just on recently from your Shrine Bowl and Senior Bowl experiences. So hopefully some familiar voices to those listening. But Joe, let me start with you. What was your your first combine experience like? It was awesome. I mean, it was it would really go in. You're immediately thrown in the fire. Like I picked up my credential, and then we had con talking at ten and ten thirty. So that was uh, that was a lot of fun. Just getting really like right in the swing of things, and it helped out too because you know we were up at eight o'clock every morning getting ready to interview guys. So you know, just having that experience of just really just getting up and at them was a lot of fun. But like I was saying, Jonathan, like the coolest thing is like you're just in the center of the NFL world. Like anybody. Who's anybody is there? Like we were talking to like Wick Martindale at lunch one day. It just you just see people walking down the street. So I just thought it was super cool. It was it was definitely a lot of fun. Yeah, and kudos to you for getting in there on that con. I think you um what I think four security guards try to hold you back and you busted through. Or, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But no, Stuff you like did that. did a great job there. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Just give me your your second time. Anything different this time around? I'm sure it's probably a little less head spinning. But was the format any different, or or what was just your general impression? being there for the second straight year. Yeah. So for the second year, they did some things a little bit different. So I was kind of sad. I was talking to Joe about this. They kind of restricted media access compared to last year, just because the amount of credentialed media. So like last year we were allowed to like get onto the field, like in the end zone. So I was like behind like sauce Gardner and Aiden Hutchinson warming up and running their 40 yard dashes and whatnot. And this year we had like a specific session or a specific session section that we in the Lucas oil stadium that we actually had to sit and it just kind of felt like like me and Joe were just sitting there. It's like, okay, this is cool, but it's just like not as interactive as it was last year. With the media side of things, like last year in the uh, convention center, we had uh, Radio Row, and then we had the bench press where like everyone would gather, coaches, strength coaches, you know, media, whatnot, and watch that. And then we had the interviews. They completely removed the bench press, put that in Lucas Oil and made that private so no one could actually watch that. So in all in all, it was just kind of like it was a different feel than last year just because, you know, it's your first time. It's like, oh, my gosh, look at all this stuff going on. Like you had it was basically almost free reign in a way, whereas this year kind of seemed a little bit more restricted just because they credentialed more media. But at the end of the day, I really enjoyed it and just the connections that you made with new members of the media, as well as being able to connect with old friends that you made down there the first time. Yeah, that seems to be the general vibe. The senior bowl is kind of the same way. It's been a bit more restrictive, a bit more structured, which which I understand, but it does kind of take some of that freedom and a bit of that access away. Joe, I'll go back to you just to kind of start. And I hate asking really big, broad questions, but there's just so much to talk about from Indy. If you could just kind of give me one overall impression, your biggest takeaway, and I know that you guys have many, but your biggest takeaway from your time at Indy, whether that's just the players or Steelers related specifically, what was your overall number one thought exiting Indy? Yeah, I think my biggest takeaway, and it's Steelers related. I wrote about it with the thing in the article me, Jonathan, and uh, Josh put together. But it's just like for all the all the attention, maybe you know, wrongly that we, they, that's been put on like the Steelers' interest in offensive tackles through the draft. They really they only met with the top three guys. Uh, they didn't really go deeper than that. So obviously, you know, you're going to do your due diligence and meet with the top guys. Um, but really the only one I would see them taking, I think at 17 would be Skronsky. And even then I think they may kick him inside the guard. Um, the fact that they had a little bit more interest, even at the senior bowl too, uh, talking to, you know, interior guys definitely was something that stood out to me. Um, I mean, uh, Jonathan were talking about this. Like, I really think they have a lot of faith in Dan Moore for, you know, at least one more year to start on that left tackle position. So I don't think if, even if they do draft a guy, uh, I don't think he's going to be a year one starter. So just looking at who they met with and talking to those guys, that was probably my biggest take. 
Dave, any any questions that you wanted to ask? Uh, yeah, look, I mean, I, I, and look, I think that's kind of something that 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 Alex and I have discussed. Uh, you know, he, going back to the end of the regular season, there is does this team, you know, like their tackles, you know, more than what <laughs> everybody else does uh, out there? And you know, I think Jonathan, you 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 kind of came to the same conclusion as uh, Joe did too that it. And, you know, look, I, I think a lot of people think guys like Broderick Jones are going to be be gone early and 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 Paris Johnson and should should indeed one of those top three guys like uh, Johnson uh, or Broderick Jones or, 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 or Peter Skaronsky end up falling down there, then, you know, potentially they run the card up for one of those three guys there. But is that kind of your main takeaway? I think you tweeted out something along the lines, uh, you know, uh, what, what Joe just said as well, too. It just feels like, and this doesn't say that the team ha- they can't take a tackle later on in the draft, but it just, it feels like, uh, you know, first round or two that tackle might not be in the plans unless one of the top three falls to him. Yeah, kind of just looking at the tackle class in general, it just seems like compared to most years, the top guys at the top, while talented, they don't really have that Penny Sewell, Tristan Wirfs kind of upside. Uh, you can kind of poke holes in a lot of different people's games, like me and Joe Clark sat down and talked about uh, Broderick Jones for a little while. It's just does he really start over Dan Moore Jr. year one? from week one and what we kind of saw just basically off of going back off of his tape. It's just like, no, if he's not going to start right away, you know, is he a year two? is he a year away? Is he a year away from being a year away? Uh, Paris Johnson has his issues while he has all the tools that you want for in a traditional franchise left tackle. But again, he's looking to be probably a top 10, 12, top 12 pick. Peter Skaronsky, is he a guard? Is he a tackle? He sees himself as a tackle having conversation with him. A lot of teams that he's talked to sees himself as a tackle. But again, would Pittsburgh be interested in drafting him as a tackle or drafting him and kicking him inside the guard to potentially replace a guy like Kevin Dotson? And like we've talked about before, and we've kind of been on since the end of the season, like they've shown faith in Dan Moore Jr. every step of the way possible. And while they've also shown faith in Kevin Dotson, you got to look at like the contract situation as well, too, which is something, you know, that Khan and Weidel and everyone else has in or is, has in the back of their mind. Dotson's entering the last year of his deal, whereas Dan Moore has two more years left on his deal. And while not a franchise left tackle, he's a serviceable left tackle on a cheap rookie deal. So with that case, it's like, do you draft someone who is tackle guard at like flex or flexible and can play multiple positions and have him come in to be more of an interior guy? And play, you know, potentially be that guy that pushes Dotson and potentially is the replacement for Dotson at the season's end into 2024 or potentially replaces him in 2023. Or do you draft a guy to potentially be that swing tackle for more, but really doesn't have the chance to push more out. So that's something that we kind of talked about and just kind of made more sense of as we were talking prospects. Dude, did you get the the consensus, both of you? Uh, at, at the combine when it comes to Peter Skaronsky, that people are split uh, on him. You know, Daniel Jeremiah seems to be kind of split, you know, saying during the broadcast that, you know, he's talked to some people, you know, some people that think he's a tackle. Some people think he's going to be a, be a guard. Uh, what is that the general takeaway in Indianapolis that people really don't know? You know it depends on the team that drafts them, what they're going to do with them. Yeah. The vibe I got, is I mean, people think he's going to be a good tackle, but he could be like a really good guard. Like he could be a perennial pro bowler at guard. So if you know you have a need at tackle, you can draft him. You're going to get a guy who's going to probably be an okay, a pretty solid offensive tackle. But if you want to kick him inside the guard, you're getting like uh, just you're getting a guy who's going to anchor your offensive line at that guard position for years to come. Whereas if he's a tackle, he's still a skilled player, but he's not going to be as skilled. So you know, I think it's. That, that was the consensus I got just from talking to people. So I guess it's really just going to depend on, you know, what a team wants and what a team needs out of them. If I could just add one maybe counter thought, because I know you, whenever you guys were talking to these players, some of the tackles, like I know Darnell Wright said he didn't have a meeting with the team at the time, but they talked to those guys at the senior bowl, right? And so I feel like they've talked to all the top tackles just at different places. Some of the guys they talked to at the senior bowl, they weren't going to talk to at the combine because you only get 45 of these interviews. Let's talk to some of the underclassmen like Paris Johnson, like Broderick Jones, like other players, other positions um, that we haven't gotten to see and, and, and actually sit down with. So, you know, I don't want to say that I, I agree that I think 
tackle isn't as big of a need as I think what fans think. I think Pittsburgh is more comfortable with their tackles than than what the general consensus may be on the outside. But I feel like they have talked to all the top tackles in this class just at different places, be it the senior bowl or the combine. Yeah, and kind of going off that point, like a like you said, like Darnell Wright was had, like actually pulled out his phone, was trying to scroll through like his schedule to see like if he could actually if he actually had a meeting with the Steelers or something like that coming up. He just like I'd have to get back to you. I don't really know what's going on, but I mean, traditionally, what we've kind of learned is that you know with the formal meetings, if you know a, a tackle or a player in general is going to be the Steelers pick at seventeen in the first round. Traditionally, they do have a formal interview at the combine, regardless of that they're at the Senior Bowl or not. So that's where you kind of get in the fact like, okay, let's use more people. Cause I don't know when I talked to John Michael Schmitz, he didn't say that he met with the Steelers currently formally at the, at the, at the combine, but he met with them at the senior bowl. Right. And then and they also talked to a guy like Joe Titman, a center from Wisconsin, who was not at the senior bowl, but was there at the combine and is right there neck and neck with John Michael Schmitz as the top center in this draft class. So I think that again, it's being able to spread your 45 formal visits uh, you know, wisely, but at mm-hmm. the same time, it's also like, you know, quantifying, you know, if they see this guy as a round one player, like, okay, is Darnell right and play at 17 or is he more of a 32 guy just based off of how their board plans out? And if they didn't actually formally interview him at the combine, did they have a formal with Tippman? Did Tippman say if he met with Pittsburgh? He had a formal. Yes. Okay. And again, that's an example of guy that wasn't at the all-star game. So we're going to talk to him because we're going to wisely use the because it also used to be that that a first round, it's a lot of underclassmen. So generally, you don't get to talk talk to those guys at the senior bowl if, it's, if you're drafting a junior. And then it used to be at 60 of these interviews. Now it's down to 45. So there's kind of a heightened need, to, as you said, John, to kind of be resourceful with how you spread out at, at 45. But Joe, I want to go to you um, just to kind of go back to to the initial um, scrum with Omar Khan. Your overall impressions with talking to Omar Khan, his responses, kind of getting to see him for the first time, just your overall thoughts on, I guess, kind of how he handled the media and, and some of the things he had to say. Yeah. I mean, definitely he was the first of the day, really the first day of the combine for a first time GM's got to be uh, a little nerve wracking, but you know, he did a good job. He, um, you know, he gave the answers you kind of wanted to hear that they're commencing negotiations with Sutton, uh, that they want to resign high Smith. Um, he he kind of tipped his hand on the Trubisky restructured extension by saying he wants him here for multiple years, but you know, he did a good job, you know, playing things close to the vest, not giving up too much and also not giving up too little. I thought in general, you know, he handled the media. Well, he's not, he's, I mean, he's a, he's a pretty, uh, just a pretty casual guy. You now he can crack a few jokes up there. Um, you know, he just he keeps the media at bay, I guess, in a good way. Um, he's not really just like a bunch of hounds coming in at him. Uh, he, he's got, he's got a good presence up there to kind of control, uh, and get the information out that he wants to get out. It was, I was definitely impressed by him, especially, you know, given the circumstances that he was really one of the first guys of the day to speak. Dave, any, uh, anything else you wanted to add? Yeah. Uh, who, uh, you know, coming away from all these groups of players and obviously over, over a span of several days there. And, you know, obviously you couldn't be in front of every player, uh, for every media session there, but I thought you guys as, as a whole did a good job of picking and choosing which ones. Who who were some of the ones that you came away with, you know, being right there in front of them and listening to them answer some of these questions? Uh, and, and once again, across all positions here, who were a few of them that 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 jumped out to you and said, man, I could because I, I do this, too, as part of the process, uh, probably not so much this early. I'll do I do try to go back and try to watch and listen to as many of these interviews from the combine and pro days that I can. But usually I hold that off until later when I have a smaller list of players that I think could be the guy. Uh, and I'd listen to him and, and I watch him and I say, oh, man, I could see that guy being a stealer and how holding his initial press conference kind of thing. Were there three or four guys each from you that you came away thinking, you know what, I could see that guy being a stealer? I'll start out with this one. So I kind of gravitated more to the defensive back. So I have three that come to mind right away. Uh, one uh, is a guy that me and Alex kind of gravitated toward uh, during the senior bowl is Darius Rush, cornerback from South Carolina. So his teammate Cam Smith has been getting all the first round hype, but Darius Rush has done everything in his power to go ahead and, you know, elevate his draft stock, at least from the media perspective, who knows whether that's the case with teams, but post the the fastest time of 21.65 miles per hour at the senior bowl that was recorded throughout the week when his long or his big question was long speed runs a four, three, five, four, three, six in the 40 
does a lot of testing well at nearly six foot two. I think he was like 197 pounds or something like that. So he overall looked there. He looked the part and he proved like his athleticism concerns and put them to bed basically. And then during his time at the senior bowl, like there's times where he kind of looked like he was guessing, but at the same time, like he also showed like he was able to stay sticking coverage, but that man, like when he speaks at the podium, it's just like, you cannot help. I, I'm like a Darius Rush fan. Like I did not know what to expect of him when I first saw him at the senior bowl, but even talking to him there, he's like, I was wanting to talk to Zach Pickens, the defensive lineman from his team. And he was just sitting there with him. He's like, Oh dude, you want to talk to me? I was like, yeah, sure. And we ended up having like a 15 minute conversation about him, his backstory, his life, coverage schemes at South Carolina, his teammate Cam Smith, his interaction with Mike Tomlin and how he was just kind of awestruck being able to talk to him, how he's willing to do anything, how he's like a core special teams guy. Me and Alex kind of pointed it out at the senior bowl. Like he was like going through and high fiving every single teammate he had when he was going through like the warm up lines with his teammates. And that just sticks out to you. That's something that scouts are going to see. And then also talking about his like, backstory with life like he ended up meeting with ike taylor and grady brown informally at the senior bowl again because they, he met formally at the Steelers, or at, he met informally at the combine because he met formally at the senior bowl and was just talking about how him and grady were in like the same fraternity like grady at a different school and him at south carolina and then just talk, talking about with ike taylor about different things when he was playing back in the day and he was just talking about how like his faith like guides him to be a good leader a good role model a good leader of men and just like man like I, I'm a Darius Rush fan, and while this cornerback class, like, they could easily take Joey Porter Jr. at 17 or someone else, like, just that way that man talks. I want him to be a stealer, not, bad, like, pretty bad, especially in, like, that third, fourth round. He's probably out of the fourth round now. He's probably a, squarely a day-two guy, the way he's performed. Same goes with Jamie Robinson, the safety out of Florida State. So when talking to him, he was, like, he was very moved by, like, how Mike Tomlin talked to him in his formal meeting and how they interacted during the senior bowl as well, too. But it's just his background, having five brothers, one died when he was five years old. The other one got sentenced to 10 years of prison when he was 10, how he helped one brother get on his feet in Tallahassee when he was at Florida state and find a job, how he was in a single parent household and how his mom helped like helped raise them all. And basically how he plays football for the enjoyment of his mother and being able to see her have joy in how he plays on the field and just the way he conducts himself as a leader of men, he's, I wrote the interview on him just the, the other day. And I was just like, this man's lived a lot of life for 22 years of age. And it's just one of those things where you talk to him and you see a guy that not only fits at safety, but he also has played all over the secondary. And he feels like that, you know, that big nickel or that nickel that can play, you know, in the slot, play against tight ends, play against slot receivers, just because that's what he was asked to do at Florida State. And a similar player, uh, Clark Phillips, the Utah cornerback, he definitely feels like that Mike Hilton esque kind of player. He has it where he had a notebook that he bought from a dollar general store. And he basically has been writing his goals. Like it could be small goals. It could be big goals in this notebook ever since he was in high school. And he's been keeping it. He'd be sharing them with his coaches, with his support staff, with like his close inner circle and try to accomplish those goals. And he keeps doing that. And just how cerebral he attacks the game, how while his size and his athleticism, you know, he didn't have the greatest RAS score in the world by any means, but just how he is able to play on the field, how he's able to battle guys like Drake London, like Jackson Smith and the Jigba, like Jordan Addison, and how he holds his own, even though he's not the biggest, not the fastest, not the tallest. Like, he just feels like that gritty stealer where it's just like, okay, if they don't take a guy that's on the outside, he's a guy that would perfectly fit in the nickel and gives you kind of that Mike hilton S type of player. Uh, before we uh, uh, get uh, Joe's a- answer to that same question, there was Rush. Do you uh, uh, the Senior Bowl awards? You know that they give out every year from each team in each position group. Was Rush one of those winners? Do you remember? Yep, yep. He was the defensive back player of the week for I, what was it? The national team, I think it was. But yeah, he was like the national team defensive player of the week. I don't know if he. Was, I don't think he was the defensive MVP. But I know that he was the award winner for the DBs on that team. That's interesting. That's very, very, that, that's, that's a dot connect right there. Okay, uh, Joe? Yeah, so not to get too DB heavy, but I'm going to kick off with two DBs. Um, one guy I talked, I would say definitely kind of carried himself really well was uh, Jordan Battle, the safety out of Alabama. He, uh, he was like just, his IQ shone through in his interview. Just somebody asked him about his strengths. He unprompted and brought up his weaknesses. Just the way he was, you know, he was able to like talk about his game really open and honestly. Um, he, I mean, he was a funny guy. He was engaging. Um, you talked about, you know, being coached by his dad growing up a couple of times, 
you know, growing uh, up with a bunch of guys from South Florida there in the draft class and what it kind of means to him with like, hey, he played youth basketball, Zay Flowers and Kenny McIntosh, the uh, running back out of Georgia. So just like he was he was he was a super great guy. I was uh, in the front row talking to him for uh, quite a while. Uh, another one I'll say is uh, Tyreek Stevenson, the corner from Miami, transferred from Georgia. He actually talked about how he's starting a nonprofit to kind of, you know, help kids growing up from South Florida uh, that were in like a similar situation that he was. And he would just seemed like a super genuine person. Uh, just a guy who seems, you know, to really, he's going to really take advantage of his platform that he's going to have in the NFL. Uh, another one I'll go is Keandre Coburn from Texas. You know, he talked about his mindset. He was really open about how he changed his ways. Um, he said he was, you know, he used to, you know, almost be a little bit lazy and unmotivated. He's like, it's for me, it's such a little thing. He's like, I cut my hair. He's like, people don't notice that. But like for something like that, that was huge for me. So I thought that was, um, you know, that was really interesting to hear his perspective on how his mindset has changed over the last few years. And, you know, obviously he's got the connection to Carl Dunbar. Um, so he's, you know, maybe a guy to watch too for uh, Pittsburgh. And then uh, one more that I'll kind of throw out there is Ricky Stromberg. I know he talked to Josh too at the Shrine Bowl a lot about it, but the way he kind of dove into his technique and his love of the techniques out of football was super impressive to me. Uh, he's, I mean, watching him on film, he's a very good player. And then listening to him talk about it off the field, you know, it's clear that he's a guy that really, really puts in the work to get better uh, just all the time. And he was, he was awesome to talk to about that um, and hearing his perspective, you know, on the, on that part of his game. So uh, those, those would probably be, you know, my four that I'd throw out there that, jumped out to me just walking away from Indianapolis. For those who haven't been there to the combine, myself included, just kind of give me a feel for what that interview process is like. Does every guy have a bunch of media members at that podium or are there some where everybody's kind of flocking to one or two players and there's a couple guys just sitting there waiting for someone to ask them a question? Kind of give me either one of you guys kind of give me a walkthrough of what that looks like. It's definitely the latter. So with that, like, you know, you can kind of expect when it's quarterback day, like there's 60, 70 people around like, whereas like, you know, you might have, uh, what is it? Like, I mean, Lee Canahan, Cunningham, a decent amount of people, but like Jake Hayner doesn't have very many people around him. So like, you know, with that, you kind of have to think when personally, I want to make sure to talk to some of the guys that, you know, are key guys that we need to talk to Brian Brzee. Jordan Addison, Joy Porter Jr. And those people just are mobbed. Like it's just a scrum and you right. may get a question or two in. Whereas like other guys, like when I was talking to Clark Phillips, like he had, you know, he had like five, six guys around him, but it was basically me and him just having a straight dialogue for like two minutes. And then the same thing with like, what was it? Zach Koontz, the tight end from Old Dominion. He was on a smaller table away from the podiums. So I basically got like three, four minutes with him by myself until I like had all my questions answered that he wanted, that he like answered for me. I was like, okay, time to go talk to another tight end. So it's definitely one of those things where it's kind of like a popularity contest in a way Mm -hmm. where, you know, the biggest names are going to be attracting the most people. So like for us, when we were on like the last day of interviews, it was running backs and offensive line. Uh, B. John Robinson had like 50 guys around him, but then all these other people like did not have any guys at all. So me and Joe like literally talked to like five, six guys each in the time that the B. John like interview went. So we were able to get a bunch of informals that they had with like Eddie Faulkner, the running back coach, rather than waste our time with B. John because we know he's not in play. Right. And I think it's the last time that Zach Koontz will have nobody around him given the workout that he had. So so I love that. Joe, to go to you, just to talk about one player specifically, your thoughts on Jordan Addison came in at a buck 73. His numbers weren't terrible. I don't want to frame it that way, but given the context of the weight and, and the expectations he had about how fast he was going to run a four four nine forty, 40 um, exited with a back injury. Your thoughts on Addison overall? Is he still in play in 17? And could this kind of underwhelming workout potentially push him down to say 32. Yeah. So I said to Jonathan, I don't think the speed's going to hurt him as much as, you know, it might be is being made out to be on Twitter. Cause he's kind of, if you watch him, it's his route running is really what separates him. That makes mm-hmm. him one of the top receivers in this class. So, I mean, four, four, nine, you would like to see a little bit better, but I don't think that's really going to kill him and kill his stock. Um, I think he's probably still in play at 17. I'd be a lot more comfortable taking him at 32, but I'm not sure Pittsburgh, if they really like Addison, if they're going to chance that he uh, that he goes to a team between 17 and 32. So what me and Jonathan were talking about, you know, what our ideal scenario is going to be is if they're, you know, locked on to Addison um, or even like a guy like Brian Brise, who you think could be there a little bit later, 
uh, trade down. Like we, we were talking, it, it was a guy like that. You could probably trade down, you know, maybe 22, 23 and still probably be able to get. And then obviously, you know, this team needs a little more, little more picks in the middle rounds. So I, I think a trade down scenario, if you're, if you're really locked into Addison, to take him in the first round would be the ideal route to go. But just given how, you know, I kind of think the board's going to shake out. I definitely think he's a guy who would probably be in play at 17. Um, again, I don't know at, right now if I would love it. I would like it, like I said, a little bit more at 32. But I don't know if that workout really hurt him too, too much. Uh, just because of, you know, the way he plays. He's a guy that you know, looks a lot better, you know, and not just doing, you know, the underwear Olympics. That And you get him on the field that he's a guy that kind of makes more plays. So, um Definitely, definitely an interesting prospect. When you look at the, what I'd like to call maybe the true guard class, it seems like there's so many guys in, you know, uh, uh, in this offensive line class this year that they're either tackles that people are saying, well, he's going to kick in, has to kick into guard, or there's a few centers that say, hey, you could probably kick that guy out to guard. When you start going down the list of the guys have actually, you know, the, the truer guards at the combine, it, it, it really seems to get thin quick. And that's why a guy after his workout, John Gaines, I kind of jumped on his tape and it went, man, what a great interview. It seemed like he had, and he's an experienced guy, but uh, talk about kind of once, you know, that depth, at the guard position as true guards. And unfortunately Voorhees got hurt, but uh, that's a conversation I think Alex and I are probably going to have during the rest, uh, uh, either in the early portion of this show or later in the show. Uh, but talk about what if you take the true guard depth uh, in this class as, as a takeaway from the combine and the other one of you take the kind of that past the top three or four guys of the, the kind of the true defensive tackles that the Steelers might be interested in and who that, that next set of guys are. I'll take the defensive tackles, Joe, if you want to take the guards. Yeah, it's good with me. Okay. Jump in one of you. All right. So defensive tackles. So kind of like we always try to play the blues clues of like who the Steelers may be interested based off of like, you know, measurables and whatnot. And I think you guys really hit it on the head. Uh, that one podcast while we were down in Indianapolis talking about guys like Brian Brzee and Jervon Dexter being two noticeable fits at that, just because they both are, you know, right around six, four, six, five, both come in around 300 pounds, don't have the longest arms, which is where you want that length, especially for a higher pick. But I mean, they definitely pro or they definitely profile as that three tech four. I both had formal meetings with the Steelers. Javon kind of talked about his relation or being able to meet with Mike Tomlin and whatnot. And like, that was also a very good uh, catch on you, Alex, for being able to find out that, you know, Carl Dunbar's son or whatever is like the strength conditioning coach mm -hmm. there. I talked to my uh, strength conditioning coaches at the university of Florida. They're now at uh, Ole Miss. So I talked to them for like half an hour before going to an interview Dexter. And they just said, this guy is a guy that has a ton of untapped potential in a similar way to when they coached, Chris Jones from Mississippi State before he got drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs in the second round. Just a guy that just had all the physical tools that you want, just needs to put together on tape. I did his film breakdown. And like for Dexter, it was one of those things where he has everything that you want. It just, his tape frustrates you because his pad level, sometimes he stops his feet, things like that. But at the end of the day, I think he's a guy that you definitely would like to target on day two. Same with Brian Brzee, but going outside of the top guys, like, Obviously, Kalijah Kansi is a big question mark just because of the measurables. Does he fit? Is he a guy that he would take? Probably would say no. Uh, Mozzie Smith wasn't able to interview with us. Neither was Siaki Ika, the two like traditional nose tackles. But they definitely profile as guys that you know would fit that nose tackle for the Steelers. It's just a matter of okay, do you spend thirty two or forty nine on them, or do you try and grab like? a Byron Young, a Keandre Colburn, a Cameron Young, like one of those guys later in the draft with like one of your mid or late round picks. Uh, other guys that kind of stick out, uh, Mike Morris was interviewed. He's more of a traditional edge. He's just a pumped up edge rusher, having that like six foot six, 285, 290 pound frame. But he's more of like the edge rusher. He's always like talked about, I'm an edge rusher. So I don't know if he'd actually kick inside. Zach Pickens is a guy that also kind of has that ability to play more than nose or the three tech, having that size, having that strength. Again, he's just very raw. He being a former five-star athlete that hasn't really put it all together yet. 
one guy that I kind of like, a, I kind of latched onto before the interview process at the combine was Colby Wooden, the defensive lineman from Auburn. Again, a little bit light in the pants, being about 280, 285, but he has like the necessary qualities that you kind of look for at that three tech four. I would just need to add a little bit more weight. But the thing that sticks out with him is that he's actually a very proven pass rusher. He has a lot of tools in his toolbox in terms of hand uses, as well as being able to win with power to be able to win and beat guards and centers as a pass rusher. Again, he only, I don't think he spoke with the Steelers at the point that I interviewed him. So that's kind of like something to take from there, but definitely a guy to keep your eyes on, especially when it comes to Auburn's pro day. And if we do see a guy like Carl Dunbar there. Could, could, could Kobe, could, could Wooden, uh, looking at him at per in person, does he look like a guy that could add more weight and it's like he can carry it? Yes. Yes. So like with him, like when I saw, when I talked to Leal last year, he was one of those guys where he had a thick lower half and like his upper body was like a little bit lighter. So you saw that you could add a little bit more weight with him and he ended up adding a little bit more weight. But again, he's still that, what is he? Whereas Colby Wooden's take, you see him win with a lot more power and a lot more strength than what you saw out of Leal, who was more finesse with how he wins as a pass rusher, as well as being able to stop the run. With Colby Wooden, he definitely looks like he has a strong lower half definitely can add more to that as well as his upper half. He has a strong like upper body, but you definitely see where he can get comfortably to that 290, 295. I don't know if he can get to 300 plus, but again, I don't want to take away from his functional athleticism as a pass rusher, if that makes sense, as long as he's able to hold his own at the line of scrimmage and being able to continue to win with power. All right, Joe, how about that? uh, You know, how about that true guard class? Yeah, no. So, I'm definitely with you on uh, Gaines, Dave. He was a guy me and Josh really loved to watch the Shrine Bowl. I've watched some UCLA tape to watch him and uh, his teammate, Antonio Mafi, who's also a guard. Um, I think he's a guy that's really getting slept on in this class. Um, why did he? Why didn't he get a? Why you look at his tape, at least from what I've seen, and you look at the interviews, and you look at how position flexible he was at UCLA. How did he not even end up as an original Shrine Bowl guy or a Senior Bowl guy? You know? Yeah, I know that it. It's guys like that. I, it makes no sense to me because you watch them on tape, and you're like, this guy's a fantastic offensive lineman. You know, he's got good technique. He's got good power. He's got really good punch. That was really what stood out at the Shrine Bowl is, you know, his punch is, he packs a lot of power in that punch. Um, so I just, uh, some, I don't know how those guys get overlooked. But in terms of, you know, the real, like, true guards, obviously the Steelers didn't meet with Torrance at the Combine because I met with him at the Senior Bowl. He's one of those guys. Um, another guy, you know, outside of... Is, is, is Torrance the best guard in his class from what you've seen so far? I, I in, terms true of true, in terms of true guards, yeah, I would say okay. so. I think it's, I mean, it, it's... A weird class because, like you said, there's just not the true guards because you talk to these guys and they want to add that versatility because to them and, and it does it makes them more attractive to an NFL team that they can play a variety of positions along the offensive line. So in the USA, hey, what are you working on? Ninety five percent of those guys are saying I'm working on my versatility so I can move around the line. Um, but another guy, you know, outside of Voorhees, who he, I don't think he made it to the podium because I was I wanted to talk to him a little bit, but uh, I think he was on those guys like Smith and Eco that uh, got caught up, you know, either with the medicals or whatever they had to do. Is uh, Emil Ike your Jr. from Alabama? Um, he's probably, you know, I would say he's probably around that day two, probably third, maybe maybe fourth round, but I think he's probably a day two. He's he's a true guard who's definitely caught my attention. Um, and then another one. That you know is is pretty intriguing. I want to check out a little more of his uh, Chandler Zavala from NC State. So I mean, it just it's it's just a weird class because just a lot of these guys they want to have that position flexibility, so they're not they. It's just it's a weird class for those guards. So yeah, Torrance I would definitely say is the best true guard in the class. Um, probably the only one that has you know really any chance to be taken in the first round, and even then, um, probably the definitely the back half of the first round. Because me and Alex are probably going to talk about this at either on the front side or the back side of this, Voorhees, Voorhees and Alex identified him kind of right out, out of the sheet, and the title of his uh, post was something along the lines that the Steeders better show interest in Voorhees and all like that. Uh, you know, unfortunate injury, obviously, with him at the Combine, but, I mean, that guy might be the best you know, prior to the injury, the best true left guard uh, in this class uh, injury all. And, and let's say he misses his entire rookie season. 
Uh, well, everybody probably by now has seen that even though he suffered that injury, he went, went to the bit session. And Jonathan, maybe you can talk about how hard that actually is with him not being able maybe to play at one of those legs and put up the reps that he did there. But uh, would you be in favor of the Steelers, let's say, spending a fourth round pick on Voorhees, even if they did not get him his rookie season, assuming the rest of the medicals are, are, are clear on him the rest of the way? Yes. So I'll first speak on the bench press. So having been a strength conditioning coach for like, you know, D1 schools as well as just other places. So when we like bench press, we try to think of five points of contact. So we try to think, making sure you have both feet down, you have both, you have your, your butt, you have your shoulders and you have your head all on like firmly placed on either the ground or the bench. So that way you can stabilize because a lot of people try to make the bench press like, a shoulder lift when their elbows will flare, which is not what you want. You want to make sure you build leverage and to build leverage, you make sure that you drive your feet into the ground and kind of like make sure that you keep yourself braced. So that way you can turn out more reps. So for him to be able to do that on one leg is freaking incredible. I was just watching that. I was like, Oh my gosh, like he's doing what I would do for like, you know, 185 or, you know, 135 and doing that for 225 with ease. And it was just, it was incredible. So yeah, very, very difficult to do. Very, very impressive. But speaking to that for the fourth round pick, absolutely. I would do that all day, every day. I just kind of look back to a similar situation last year with Damone Clark, the linebacker from LSU, who had the next final thing. And that immediately dropped his draft stock a lot because he had that surgery. And he was a guy that me, Alex, and a bunch of other people wanted like firmly in the second round just because he kind of fit similar kind of vibes to like, you know, that height, weight, speed, you know, player specimen to like what Jack Campbell is. Different games, but kind of like that big line, souped up linebacker that the Steelers need. Uh, but with Damone Clark, he ended up falling into like the fifth, almost the sixth round and the Cowboys drafted him. And then they almost had an embarrassment of riches, riches. I mean, while Michael Parsons being more of an edge rusher, like they still had guys like they signed Anthony Barr. They had Leighton Van Der Esch. They had Damone Clark. They had Jabril Cox. They had a lot of guys at that inside linebacker spot and Clark ended up playing and playing well for them at the end of the season. And it was just because like of the medical that happened with him. So with Voorhees, he's a guy that. It's probably a plug and play left guard when healthy right away. So with him, if you can grab him in the fourth round and you, while you may need to medically redshirt him, you get three new, three more years of a starting left guard play and probably a high quality starting left guard. I would be fine with that. Alex put out a video earlier about how he's just a perfect fit for the Steelers or how the Steelers should have interest in him. And while it feels like, oh, well, they raised it a fourth round pick. How many other starters are you often going to find at the beginning of day three? Versus a guy that you have to wait, develop, maybe play on special teams, and then hope maybe he can crack the, li- or crack, crack the lineup next year. And you already know that you have that in a guy like Voorhees, should the medicals come clear, because he does have a very extensive injury history. And I would just say, and, and Dave and I will talk about it more, you know, just separately, but there's a chance even Voorhees could come back late this year. David Ajabo tore his Achilles at his pro day. He played this year. Jamison Williams tore his ACL in the championship game. He played at the end of uh, 2022. So I wouldn't even necessarily rule out wherever Voorhees goes, him coming back into November, and potentially being able to contribute to a team. I just had a, a two questions left, and this one is not going to be uh, hyper relevant to the Steelers, but I want to get your guys' perspective, just given the uniqueness of it. And I know the details are still unfolding, but both you guys give me a vibe of what happened whenever that news came in about Jalen Carter's arrest warrant. He was you know, scheduled to speak, waiting on him to speak, obviously did not, uh, did not speak there, but um, Jerry, I'll start with you kind of, did you kind of feel that buzz start going around that room as that news kind of went in and, and people found out about what was happening with Jalen Carter and, your thoughts on how this could potentially impact his draft stock. Yeah, that was kind of my, uh, my, I guess I'll say welcome to the combine moment. Mm. Cause the first thing that came out was, I think it was the pro football talk article that said, Oh, you know, he might've lied to investigators and they're looking into it. And then I think it was like five, 10 minutes later that the Seth Emerson report came out that he had the warrant and you, um, the session. So I think he was the session that was up was the Mozzie Smith session. So I remember I was waiting to talk to him and all of a sudden, like, it, I, I think it, was, it might've just been a total coincidence, but like four or five guys in that session didn't come out because of the medicals, but all of a sudden like guys are show up to the podium. So people are like, well, are, are people going to come out? Like, what's the deal? Are they canceling availability for the day? So nobody really knew what was going on because like there's four or five defensive tackles that weren't there. And then 
they brought like one or two guys out on one of the far podiums. So it's like, all right, well, these people are still talking. But then, I mean, I said th- I thought it was pretty clear at that point that Jalen Carter was not going to talk. But just the scrum of people who went over to the Jalen Carter. <laughs> I <podium> saw. Was, <laughs> how many people? Was, how many people actually do you think st- were standing around an empty podium for Carter? Oh, they were standing there for a while because I was going around. Me and Jonathan are going around and talking to the other guys. By like the after like twelve minutes of there, there was still. A, a huge horde of people standing around the empty podium. Like, wow. how, how many of you had to guess? Like thirty. How many people do you think were oh, around? Oh, there? more than thirty. I mean, it oh was so the way the way the podium is. It's it's there, and then there's um like the TV mounted stage, and it was all the way back to where the TV where like the camera stage is, and it was like it was it was deep. It was probably like it was rows and columns of people. It was Man. it was it was crazy to watch. It was I mean it was one of the most attended sessions, for, especially for a guy who didn't talk. It was right up there with you know like a uh, Anthony Richardson almost with how many people were there waiting to the hope that he would come out. But yeah, no, it was crazy. I mean, it was, it was first it was, it was, it was a little buzzy. It was a little bit eerie too. And you, you know, you get the details and everybody's like, wow, this guy's right here. Um, like what's going to happen. So it was, it was definitely weird to be a part of, but also super interesting. Uh, Jonathan, just kind of your, your quick thoughts on that environment and that in those couple of moments. Yeah, it was interesting because I was in the Nolan Smith interview before Car because it was like the edge rushers before the defensive line. And Nolan Smith was actually asked about Carter before like, you know, the arrest and everything came viral. And he was just talking about just the character and how people say, oh, like he isn't the best character. And, you know, Nolan Smith was going up to bat for his guy saying he'd never done anything wrong. He's a great character person. You don't know him. He's misunderstood. This, that, yada, yada, yada. And then by the way, if you ever had the opportunity, if anyone can like go and listen to that Nolan Smith interview is the best interview you'll ever hear at the combine. It was incredible. But with that, at the end of that interview, kind of going into it, like that's when we started hearing murmurs and whispers and everyone was talking. It's like, oh shoot, like Jalen Carter has an arrest warrant. Well, like out. And then like everyone's like, oh, he's probably not going to show up. And then we're, there's this is like anticipation. And it kind of seemed like that Smith interview kind of started it because like, again, it wasn't like addressing like the arrest warrant or anything like that, but it definitely was like, it was a good lead up to it because everyone kind of like had that in their mind after he was talking about it. And then after that, just, you know, all hell broke loose. And then it was like just a wild frenzy of like, oh, like this is going to tank his draft stock or, oh, like he's going to be sent. And then there was news that he's like going back to Athens, Georgia to, you know, plead his case. And then, you know, ended up getting booked that night, released 16 minutes later from the prison out on bail and then ended up coming back to the combine just the next day. So it was just a wild case. And everyone was just like, what's going on? Because it's kind of unprecedented. Like, obviously, you have the Larry Tunsil situation the day of the draft. But at the Mm -hmm. combine, I don't know if I've ever experienced anything like that. Right. Where it's just a guy that's like the consensus or potentially consensus number one overall pick ends up having that happen right as he's about to take stage. So it was definitely a really weird situation for sure. My last. Go ahead, Jim. No, it's my bad. No, go go ahead. Finish your thought. What it reminded me of more almost was the Lyle Collins situation. That's kind of the first thing that flashed into my mind. So before, I mean, I think he was a sure he was going to be a first round pick, and then um, I think his ex girlfriend was murdered. And I, I think the police made clear in that case too that he wasn't a suspect, but he was brought in just to talk about it, and he ended up going undrafted. So you know, right. that was the first thing that went through my mind. I'm like, well, if Lyle Collins went undrafted when he didn't do anything wrong at the time, like, well, now is Jalen Carter going to go undrafted? You know, a week of clarity. I don't think he falls outside like the top ten now. I think mm-hmm. he's, I mean, he might fall four or five spots, but that was definitely the first, that, that situation is the first thing that popped into my mind when all the news was breaking. My last question for you guys, and then I'll let Dave finish things out. I, again, I know we're still pretty early and pro day still to come and we're still watching tape, but Jonathan, I'll start with you. If you had to guess who was the guy at 17, who would you pick? And had, do you feel any differently, you know, post combine than you felt before going to the combine about who that, that guy at 17 might be? Yeah, so I put this in our like takeaways for the combine. Like for me personally, it kind of seems like Joy Porter Jr. or Jordan Addison is the favorite at 17 overall, just based off of how they were carried at the combine, how much, you know, the pit relations and like what we know with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Like, sure, they draft based off of need, but they are very much a familiarity based team. They take pay players that they have a lot of background on, that they are familiar with. You know, the Blues clues, the connections are evident. We've seen that, you know, with obviously Kenny Pickett, like with the quarterback situation, like last year is like they showed a lot of interest in all the different quarterbacks, but Pickett made a lot of sense. 
they telegraphed to us that they wanted Najee Harris and they took him. We knew that they wanted Devin Bush and it was just a matter of trading up to get him. So this year it just kind of feels like, you know, all the connections to Joey Porter Jr., all the connections to Jordan Addison, Pickett just clamoring over and over again. I'd like to have my guy in Pittsburgh and, you know, Addison just saying, hey, come get me at the end of his presser. It's just kind of like, OK, that's kind of like while it's just like, you know, natural talk, giving people headlines because he knows how to do that being at USC this past year. Which thank you for that, by the way, Jordan Addison. We appreciate yes, the easy headline. Yes, exactly. But just for that, just it just makes too much sense. And while people be like offensive line, defensive line, we need to do this. You look at this draft class and like what Joe talked about earlier. There's a lot of cases where, you know is Brazil worth the 30 or the 17th overall pick? I would say no. Dave, you mentioned that in the past as well too. Could they take him at 17? Yes. Or they could go ahead and just see how the board plays at 32. If he's there, great. If not, you have guys like Keanu Benton. You have guys like Javon Dexter that are similar type players that have those measurables that you can take later. Whereas if they can get a guy who's a legacy player like Joey Porter Jr. to fill a position of need like outside cornerback, or be able to strengthen the passing game because, frankly, the Steelers' passing game wasn't good last year. And being able to give Kenny Pickett the guy that he knows best from college and give him that safety security blanket as well as a guy that can create after the catch and is a new outs front runner that can create for himself in the slot or out wide with Jordan Addison, I think both those guys make a lot of sense. I was kind of going through it yesterday and just kind of like going through like the consensus names who will be gone, guys like you know Bryce Young, Will Anderson, all those guys. And it kept I got to 17. And it kept feeling like Addison has a better likelihood of being there at 17 than Joey Porter Jr. You have guys like Devin Witherspoon, Christian Gonzalez, who will likely be gone. And it's like, okay, who's CB3? For a lot of teams, that is Porter. So while Porter could land there, if he is there, I think that he would be the pick at 17. But I have a feeling that he may go before that, in which case I think that Pittsburgh would pass on guys like, you know, maybe the fourth offensive tackle or guys like Brzee who have their own concerns because there's other options later and opt to give Kenny Pickett that guy that can help him take that step in year two. Cause at the end of the day, you need to have Kenny Pickett be this franchise quarterback. If mm-hmm. you're going to do that, if you could have a similar situation with the Bengals like, a couple years ago where they were told that like they should take an offensive tackle, but instead they elected to give Joe Burrow his college rep in Jamar chase. It worked out well for them. Who knows if the Steelers see that and just like, we might want to do the exact same thing. Yeah. Good thoughts. I'm with you, Joe. Same question. What are your thoughts about 17 right now? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm in the exact same boat as Jonathan that I think it would be Porter Jr. or Addison, but other names I want to throw out that could conceivably be on the board at 17 that it wouldn't necessarily shock me if they were the pick. Um, I know Dave wrote about Deontay Banks. Obviously, he's a Maryland guy. Those connections are pretty clear with Tomlin, who had a fantastic uh, combine, and he was a guy that was kind of creeping up into the first round even before his, his performance in Indianapolis, so... You know, he definitely could have improved his stock and jumped up to 17. Um, another one in the guy I met with the Steelers that we kind of talked about more, you know, around 32, but he's not going to be there at 32 is Jackson Smith and Jigba. So if they kind of value him over Addison, they think he's going to be the better receiver. I mean, he's got a ton of work in the slot. He's a technician in the middle of the field. So if that's kind of the route they want to go instead of Addison, if they really want a receiver and they have the pick of the two, um, it's, I mean, it's a name to watch. I still think ultimately they would probably take Addison just because of the picket connections, you know, the familiarity with him from his time at Pitt. But, um, I think Jason's a name to watch. And then Brian Branch, um, you know, versatility. He's probably gonna, I would, I would probably put him a corner, uh, in the NFL. Jonathan kind of made the good comparison. Like when Jalen Ramsey was coming out, he was a safety and nobody really remembers that he was a safety because he's played corner for so long. Um, obviously Branch isn't a Ramsey level prospect. But he's a guy who, you know, he talks about Micah Fitzpatrick. He played that same star position at uh, Bama. Just and those guys, usually, you know, they, 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 they tend to find some success in the NFL. Um, so he's somebody that definitely would be, uh, w- w- would be a name, I think, that would watch if he is on the board at 17. Um, obviously met with Pittsburgh. So outside of Addison and uh, JPJ, I would go with uh, JSN, uh, Banks, and uh branches guys that i think could you know potentially be the pick if for whatever reason it's not one of those two because that's where i would kind of heavily lean right now as well all right uh closing it out here earlier i asked you these guys you know co- you know to name a couple of guys that you know you you watched them at the combine and their interviews specifically 
and you thought to yourself, yeah, I like this guy coming into this and, and I could see this guy being a stealer. Let's go on the other side of the fence there where the guys that you were, you know, thinking, oh man, that, uh, you know, uh, heading to Indianapolis, this guy could potentially be a stealer. And then you saw him, uh, uh, during his media session and he turned you off for, for, for whatever. Did, did either of you have any, you know, maybe one player each where you thought, man, that guy's interview just wasn't that good. I, I'm, I'm not sure the Steelers would be interested in this guy just by the way his media se- se- session went, if that makes sense. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I really had one of those guys. Um, the only really thing that was interesting about the media session was talking to Cam Smith. Um, and, I mean, I, he seemed like he was he was a little nervous to be up there, too. And they asked him because he had a formal with the Patriots the night before, and that place was crawling with Patriots media. So they asked him about that. And he was like, oh, yeah, it was awkward. Like, it was uncomfortable. They're like, well, what, what was so awkward and uncomfortable? And he goes, well, I just don't really like talking about myself, which, like, Fine answer. Like it was, but it was just, it was just, that was kind of like a weird moment. I'm like, well, that, I mean, teams are going to ask you about yourself in your, in their formal interviews, but I don't, I mean, he, the, the, he didn't really say anything that was really like, oh, I, I couldn't see him ending up in Pittsburgh. It was just like, oh, that was the moment that sort of was like, that was kind of weird um, in, a, in the session. So um, there was, yeah, there were, I, I'm going through now who I talked to and there wasn't anybody that I'm, it was really turned off and think like, oh, yeah, no, that guy's definitely not going to end up in Pittsburgh. I mean, maybe, Maybe just from some of his answers, okay. uh, Zach, Zach Harrison, I guess I would say, but just because like he he's a guy who he's got freakishly long arms, but that's his pass rush. It, it, it is the long arm. Like I try to prod him, like, "What's your favorite pass rush move? What's your go-to pass rush move?" Other people kind of ask him some of their questions, and he's like, "Oh, it's the long arm. I love the long arm, which is great." But you gotta you gotta be able to build off the long arm, and he doesn't really have the sack production in college. And you know, he's, I mean, he's a guy that, you know, some people looked at, you know, maybe round two, round three, maybe round four, that could maybe be a fit in Pittsburgh, but just given, given that he wasn't really able to expand on his game, he's a guy that I really don't think is going to end up with the Steelers. All right, Jonathan, to you, maybe not so much somebody that turned you off, but maybe awkwardness on the stand or something, but by an answer or something like that. Yeah, kind of an awkwardness a little bit. I kind of say Drew Sanders, the linebacker from Arkansas. So he was just kind of like, there's two there's so I'll compare Drew Sanders to Jack or you know Jack Campbell because I talked to both of them. Jack Campbell naturally was a very quiet guy, was very respectful. He did not want to con- or like disclose the meetings that he had with teams, just quote unquote out of respect for them. But once you started talking to him, because I'm an Iowa guy, I got him talking about the school, got him talking about the program, got him talking about his game, about other players. Like that's when he started to open up and give some very, very thoughtful answers. Like he took me play by play through like the Ohio State game, how he made an interception, how he made a tackle for loss, how he made a safety, like how he went through all those different things. So it was one of those things where he was quiet. But when you got him talking about ball, that, that's when he really opened up. With Drew, it just kind of gave a vibe like he's a little too cool for school. He was very quiet, very short worded answers, um, kind of talking about, you know, for him, like he's kind of that tweener because he was an edge rusher for the longest time. Now it's like wants to be an off ball linebacker. He's like, well, I was an offensive guy in high school. I always want to be around the ball. I am able to be in the middle of the field as an inside linebacker. So that's why I think I'm a better fit there over edge. So he's been talking to teams like he primarily he sees himself as an off ball linebacker. So while that's not a bad thing, you know, being able to say what you see yourself as, like you often see players talking like, oh, I'll do whatever the team needs me to do. Or it's like, no, I'm going to play in the middle of the field. I want to be an off-ball backer. And just overall how he like worded questions, like he didn't give a whole lot of it, like definition or didn't give a whole lot of an explanation behind them. And so it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. It's like, okay, this guy, he had one big year. Don't get me wrong. It was a big year at Arkansas, but it's just like there's a lot of ins- – issues and inconsistencies in his tape, especially as a tackler and being able to fight blocks often. So for him, it was just like, okay, this is a guy that I definitely would not consider probably at 17 overall because he's a little bit more of a projection, maybe at 32 or 49. But again, I just didn't like the way kind of like he talked. And it kind of goes the same way with like Broderick Jones because me and Joe were just sitting in that one while we were waiting for other offensive line to come out. He just kind of came, seemed a little bit young, you know, just kind of, he have only had, so this was his first year as a full-time starter, only started four games last year for that cha- national championship team. And like, it just, his play is really raw, but also his like experience at the podium, how he addressed people too. You can tell he didn't really practice like the interview session. 
he didn't really know how, like he was just kind of going through it. So for me, it was just kind of like less professional than it was for a lot of other like prospects I talked to like Paris Johnson Jr. He's like a communications major. He's opening up his own foundation. Like that man knows how to talk at a podium. Whereas like project Jones, you could tell he's just a little, you know, immature and just inexperienced at that. All right. Well, great stuff from you guys. Jonathan Joe cannot thank you enough. You guys mm-hmm. absolutely crushed the combine with all the interviews and reporting and insight. And then of course being with us today to, to give your thoughts. So Really happy to have you guys. I'm sure we'll have you guys on the podcast before draft day, but I uh, want to thank you guys again. And I know they're, they're long days, they're early mornings. It's it's a lot of chaos, but you guys, I thought, just did a, an incredible job. I do as well, too. Can't can't thank you guys enough, and and definitely you guys will be part of uh, – we'll have a round table or two uh, talk going more in-depth on some of these guys and and their fits and their tape and all like that as we move along. But really wanted to get a lot of your you know kind of feedback, instant feedback, or as, as most recent feedback as we could uh, from your experience uh, of uh, you know in, in, the, in Indianapolis at the Combine, and uh, we appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you for having us, and I'll just like thank you for the opportunity to go. It was, it was, it was definitely, it was definitely a blast. Yeah, for me, it's just like having that full, like eyes wide open experience last year into this year is like, in a weird sense, it felt like you were going home. Like it was one of those things where you were in your comfort zone. You were around people that you know you could talk ball with. You were like new questions and how to string questions and interviews together with players and whatnot. So for me, it was just like, you know, it's just a, fe- a sense and a feeling like you belong. And I just cannot thank you enough for having a kid, you know, being able to watch every single 40, every single like workout growing up and then being able to be in the midst of it and be able to say that this is something you do. Like, again, I am I am forever grateful. Thank you so much. And welcome back to the Terrible Podcast. And again, our special thanks to Jonathan Heitrider and Joe Clark for coming on the podcast, talking about their combine insight and, of course, the work they did. I know that's a, a long couple of days there, but, uh, man, Dave, Joe, and Jonathan, they were they were so valuable for us this past week. Absolutely. Two, two, two guys that have, uh, boy, they've, they've been, uh, uh, key contributors for the site now for, for a little while now. And, you know, the path that Joe Clark kind of took to imagine a little over, I guess a year ago, we just had him writing one game recap a week. And here he is now a (laughs) full-time, a full-time guy traveling to the, to the shrine bowl, traveling to the combine and, uh, for us on our dime and all like that, just, uh, and Jonathan obviously has been part of our team for quite a while now as well, too and uh, just very, very proud of the job that they did in Indianapolis. And we look forward to having them and, and several of our other uh, draft contributors on a roundtable session or two uh, between now and uh, I guess it's 50, day, 50 days from today, Alex. Yeah, coming up pretty quick here. But yeah, we'll definitely have Jonathan, Joe, and and all the others on before late April's draft. So Dave, I know we wanted to talk about just real, real briefly, you and I, about Andrew Voorhees, the guard from USC who tore his ACL during that Sunday workout, I wrote an article yesterday saying that I don't think it's going to hurt a draft stock as much as people think. I think if you look at historically, the guys that have suffered knee injuries and some of the serious stuff before, um, bigger names and smaller names, guys like David Ajabo, Jamison Williams, but even guys like Nick Nelson, Contravious Street, their draft stock really didn't change much. Now, I think Voorhees could get dinged a little bit, maybe going from late day two to early day three. But I don't envision this as a fall out of the draft type scenario with Voorhees, barring there not being any other medical issues that we're not aware of or things that get flagged again whenever he goes back for combine rechecks in a couple of weeks. Let me take you through my process with uh, with uh, with Voorhees specifically here. Uh, obviously, you turned me on to him at first right out of shoot there uh, head, head, head of the senior ball. And I, I, I really enjoyed that post of watching uh, his tape there. I didn't really uh, go much deeper than what you had out there. Uh, fast forward through these last you know, few processes here and obviously through the combine now and having a little bit better grasp now of and and here's the key focus here the true what i consider true guards in this class now after watching uh several of them yeah there's the talk about this these these couple of tackles might can play guard maybe this center like john michael schmitz can 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 kick out to uh uh to guard maybe ricky stromberg out of, uh, out of arkansas can do that as well too and all like that but as far as true true guards in this class at the top of this class 
to me, at least where I am right now, there's not many of them. And then if you want to drill that down even further, what about guys that are that you would kind of consider true left guards at this at this this point? I I really see that list kind of being Voorhees and uh uh, Steve, Avilia Steve, Steve Avilia out of TCU, and uh, maybe even this uh, this this Sydney Sal uh, out of uh, out of uh, Eastern Michigan. There, uh, outside of that, you know, where are guys that you could plant your flag uh, with in, in 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 the early rounds? There, and it's, it is unfortunate with Voorhees. And then fast forward, obviously through the combine. I thought his combine interview was absolutely fantastic. Uh, I watched that. And, and we have the audio of that. He was one of the highlighted ones by uh, the uh, NFL Network, too, as well, too. So we were able to watch the whole thing there, uh, go through, you know, uh, up to, through his combine workout up until him getting injured. And then post, you know, uh, injury, him doing what he did, going out there and, 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 and doing the bench and all like that. I My thought now is, man, if you if you don't draft a guard you know, in, 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 or a guy that you think can play guard in the first, you know, three rounds there. If this guy is on the board for you in the fourth round, and even if you did lose the entire rookie season for him, man, I, I say take him. I, I say spend a pick on him, man. Yeah. And as disappointing as an injury is, I mean, it kind of reveals that character. And like you said, and, and Jonathan talked about just how remarkable it is to, to be one day removed from that and go out there and bench. Just, just the be- to even attempt the bench is is you know commendable enough, but not only to do that, but to have 38 reps the most of anybody at the NFL Combine this year is pretty ridiculous. And the attitude that he has, the mental toughness he shows, I think will certainly in- in- endear itself to to Pittsburgh and to the rest of the NFL. Um, and so, yeah, like I mentioned, I mean, Ajabo tore his Achilles, which is a, I think a more severe injury, I would say, uh, in, in this day and age uh, at his pro day last year, and he still went top 50. Um, Nick Nelson and, and, and Contravious Street that I mentioned earlier were kind of mid-round picks who suffered pretty bad knee injuries during uh, private workouts, and they still went fourth round, about 18 picks apart back in 2018. So I think historically, you know, if it's if it's a chronic thing, an arth- arthritis type thing, that's what tends to drop guys. If you have heart issues, Maurice Hurst, that's what drops guys in terms of like really tumbling down the trap boards. I don't see this one-off thing really hurting Voorhees all that much. The only thing I would say that concerns me. And a, and a reader on Seals Depot made a good point about this. Voorhees is older. He's 24 sure. right now. And so when you have the ACL, basically he's not going to get to play in the NFL until he's 26. That I could see as being a bit of a concern. But if he's a fourth round guy and you get three good years out of him, if that's if that's the, the worst that's thing that you, you get, got, right. that is a very good thing for a fourth round pick. So um, that that's a fair point. But I still think this guy goes fourth round because the precedent says these injuries don't hurt these guys as much as, as it may appear on the surface. And what if you got all of his, you know, three of his four rookie years out of them under contract, all, all good. And he ends up being, you know, let's say a, 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 a pro bowl type guy. And then you, you re-sign him and got three more years out of, you know, yeah, uh, not too bad. I wish all fourth round picks were that, that terrible, you know? Right. Right. Uh, now, look, uh, w- w- we obviously got a lot more offensive linemen to go through and all like that. But I, I just I, what's your feel about this interior class, uh, especially the guard guard position right now? I mean, yeah, I, I get it. You're, you're, you're and, and with good reason. You like John Michael Smith. You think maybe he can kick outside. But I'm talking about guys that we have the tape on that have played some guard. Yeah, I think I mean, I think it's a stronger interior class. I agree that. Where I kind of look at it is is more those projections, guys, those tackles that may kick inside a Skaronsky, a Tyler Steen from Alabama. And so I think it's strong in that sense. If you're looking at the true guys that have played guard that have that extensive guard tape, it probably is a bit weaker overall. But I think it's strong down the middle at center, led by John Michael Schmitz. And I think with some of those projection guys that that have kicked inside at the senior bowl and maybe kicked inside a bit with their college tape, but John Gaines that we've talked about as well. Um, I think there is strength there, but it, it's a little bit more that projection than it is the true and blue offensive guards. Okay. All right. So we'll see on Voorhees, but uh, we'll be watching that one. I Certainly think John Gaines closely. is I think John Gaines is definitely a guy to watch in this situation, maybe for the Steelers too. So 
where where you I know it's kind of so raw based off of that workout, but where do you think he lands? Is he a day two guy, like late day two, or I day think three? he's somewhere second, third round. But by the okay. time the smoke clears, I I think we're just I think us on the outside are just finally catching up with him now. You know. Well, to your uh, point, why, why is this guy a senior? Yeah, I, like, I, I, I don't know. Be catching up to him a little bit, too. Maybe that's an instance as well, too. But uh, I, I could see him, uh, you know, especially if you need a true right guard, you know. But uh, uh, I, I think sometime later in second round, uh, definitely by the end of third round, is it, you know, as I go through the rest of these guys, that's where I'm at on him right now. Yeah, I think I think he ends up going pretty high i think probably day two top 100 picks is probably my thought on gains with the really strong workout the versatility and, and kind of lacking some of those true guard types that, that i'm with you there on on, on john Gaines. all right, all right. Uh, any other things you want to talk about dave any other uh, conversations that i that i missed here G- give me a quick yes or no on lamar jackson would you sign him to a five-year fully guaranteed deal right now uh at uh 48 million or more a year that's supposed to be a yes or no. That's a huge question for a yes or no. Would I personally do that? Yes. I would not. I know, I know you were going to say no. Um, when he's healthy, though, he is so that dynamic. I know health has been the issue, but as you said, if he if he gets hurt two years and, and can win me a Super Bowl in the other two, then then it's all worth it. All right. And, and, and yes, no, I think you kind of already answered this, but he's staying in Baltimore. Is he a Baltimore starting quarterback week one, 2023? I think so. I'm with you, too. But I really want to see how this process goes because I feel like this this story is certainly not uh, close to being finished. All okay. right, Dave, let's do some reader emails and close out today's show. All right, Jesse Hernandez says, hey, guys, curious to your opinion on this. If all three are available at 17, who do who do each of you uh, choose if you're the GM? Uh, Skaronsky, Broderick Jones, or uh, Joey Porter Jr.? I, He's asking I, which I would choose there. Yeah, uh, uh, of those three, Broderick uh, Jones, uh, Peter Skaronsky, or, or or Joey. I would have to think based on kind of my ranking right now. I'd, I'd probably tend to go with Broderick Jones. I think. Yeah, it's hard to ignore kind of that high upside offensive tackle, so I, I'd probably go with, with Jones as well. All right, uh, let's go to the next question here. Wednesday podcast. Uh, question from Jason Council says, how do you think the Steelers will use Keanu Benton if he was drafted by them? Do you think he would be uh, the big nose tackle, zero tech, or defensive end, three tech? He says, personally, I think he would go do he could do either, but depending on Larry Ogan, Joby's free agency status, he says, I think his best fit would be nose due to his lack of sack production in college and him and Montrevious Adams would rotate nicely together with Adams getting, uh, getting the sack. He says, what say you thank you for all you do. Definitely the best and most knowledgeable Steelers and NFL site. Uh, there is Uh look, here's the thing with Keanu Benton. I I've seen on his tape. He, uh, he, he played all the way out to uh, log quite a few snaps uh, mostly kind of in a B gap type situation. I think he did blog, uh, uh, the next down would be over, oh, 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 you know, over the a, a gap, either in a zero or a one kind of nose type situation, not so much outside of a four I, but that's going to be what you're going to, uh, uh, find, uh, I think across the board, with most of these defensive tackles in, in, in his class too. In other words, you know, uh, would I want him to play a lot of five tech? Well, the Steelers really don't use a lot of guys, you know, that much in those in those scenarios anyway. So I think he could play up. Uh, long story short, I think Keanu ben- Benton can play up and down uh, the line for you. Yeah, that's what he did at Wisconsin. I think he was playing more of the down the line three tech four I early in his Wisconsin career than kind of kicked more inside later these last couple of years as that zero tech or shade. And so I think, you know, he's got that scheme versatility as the reader said, it kind of depends on what the rest of the defensive line room looks like. I would probably start him more as that zero one tech um, probably kind of ideal for him because maybe the foot speed on some of these perimeter stuff, not going to be his exact top skill set and some of this contain on, on stunts. Um, but I think he's a guy that certainly can play up and down the line, but I think probably zero one tech to really try to bully some of these smaller centers with the size, strength, and length is going to be ideal for him. 
All right, Deshaun Campbell writes in, what's up, guys? My question is about Lamar and the non-exclusive tag. Why is there so many different tags? We don't really see this in other major sports. Why is this in football? Why does it seem these teams have so much control of players for so long? I feel once a player gives his four or five years, he should automatically be able to control if he leaves or stays. How do you guys feel about all the tags, and should it be addressed in the next CBA meeting? Deshaun, we pretty much... uh, talked about everything kind of you just highlighted there you know why are there so many tags because the owners have been able to get them get them pushed through that's why and and they haven't been fought back enough on 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 the nfl pa and the players side there so uh you know we, we talked about things that they they the players need to do a better job negotiating come cba time there uh as far as why there are so many i mean I, just, I the only answer I, I I had to that is because they there are because that's you know that's the way they the owners thought this their side of it out in the CBA to indeed try to get as much control over the players as as, as, as even the top end ones as long as they can. You know, Dave. One last thought on this: If you're the NFLPA, I think trying to get rid of the tag outright is going to be a pretty heavy thing to do. Get rid of just the non-exclusive tag and make it exclusive only because, A, no one gets the exclusive tag anymore because I think all six that got tagged this year were non-exclusive. You know, Tell the NFL owners that, all right, you want the tag? Fine, we'll give you the tag, but you're going to pay top dollar with that exclusive tag in terms of that that price on that. And so you can have your tag if you want to keep somebody, but we're not going to let you be able to shortchange a guy with this other part of the franchise tag with a non-exclusive portion because – what did you say? Like nobody ever leaves on the non-exclusive tag. Like, nobody ever changes teams. Last time that happened was what, like two thousand and two thousand? I think two thousand. Joey Galloway. Before yeah. that was like what eighty uh, ninety six or something like that, ninety eight or something like that. So it, you know it, it doesn't have. But yeah, I, I I get your point. At least give the at least ex- force the team to expose the player to the market. No, I, well, I, I I would say the other way and say get rid of the non-exclusive because players don't have any leverage. They don't change teams. Oh, and okay. all, all, all that does is pay them less. And so make it, if only, only one tag exists, it's the exclusive tag. I, I see it. And it's a higher amount too. It's so. the higher amount. Right, so it says okay. owners, you want the tag? We'll give you the tag. You can have that right, but you're going to pay for it and not get to kind of hedge a little bit and get to use this non-exclusive thing that really gives the player typically no leverage because no one ever changes teams and you get paid less for it. So that would, that would be my, my approach if I'm the NFLPA. Look, they need that. That should be part of their next no, negotiations for sure. Is 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 to either try to get the tag to go away altogether or or what have you. So yeah. Uh, anyway, that, that that's a, we'll see how that ends up playing out down the line. Uh, Nolan Braddock writes in, love the show. No one knows the cap better than Dave. He says, can you go into some details on the Jackson situation specifically? What first round picks would be? competing with a competing team give up 2000 he said questions 2023 and 2024 what if a team had multiple first round picks in 2023 uh lamar goes to the number two lamar goes to the highest bidder unless the ravens match how do they determine the highest bidder when contract details get messy in terms of guaranteed money average annual salary contract link signing bonuses etc he says like what if atlanta offers him all guaranteed 250 million dollars over six years, but Indy offers him 300 million, but only 150 guaranteed over six years. Let's take the second part of this question for Nolan first. Uh, he has to sign an offer sheet. So he might get six of these offers out here, or let's say, or two offers like Nolan uh, just threw out here. He has to choose which one of those he would want to sign as if it was a contract that he was agreeing to. Uh, so it's up to the player to choose the best offer, sign it, and then take that back to the Ravens and say, what do you want to do? Do you want to match this or should I go uh, with this contract here? So that, that, that's an easy, easy answer to the second question there. As far as what, what first round picks would be competing to give up. My understanding is it would be a, as we sit here today, prior to the draft, it would be a 2023 and a 2024 first round draft picks automatically. Now, uh, what if a team had multiple first round picks? I would have to look. In it's, here. it's the original pick, right. it's the picks the teams actually owe, not ones they acquired. It, it, right. The original, uh, or if they had two, I don't know, look, uh, say a situation came up where they don't have their original first round, but they had, let's say, two that they acquired elsewhere. 
uh, from another team. Then my understanding would be the higher of the two. Okay, I didn't even know you could do that if you didn't have your original pick. I thought if you didn't have your I, I, I don't know for pick, sure, but but but, but, but that's my loose understanding. Okay. Uh, uh, understanding of it so okay. uh and i'll have to research do they have to own their original round picks in both 2023 or in 2024 okay i know that if you don't have a first round pick you can't put it in an offer sheet so miami for example has no first round pick this year forfeited in the, in the tom brady sean payton hole scandal and so they technically can't put it in an offer sheet on Lamar Jackson because they don't have the compensation to give Baltimore, although they could, I guess, do the whole sign and trade thing, which circumvents the whole thing in the first place. Uh, This is an area that I haven't gotten deep into into CBA, but uh, my, you know, what I I guess the question becomes, what if, like I said, they, their original pick, they traded away, but through some sort of process, they had acquired uh, two, first round 2023 picks that weren't originally theirs, could they still play in this game? And I don't want to answer wrong. So I'll, I'll say, I don't know for sure. Yeah. I'm not sure on that one either. I'll have to, I'll have to research that out, but yo, I, 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 what Alex said is correct. Like the dolphins can't get into play until this. And my understanding is, is until after After the draft draft. happens where then I guess it would become a 2024, 2025 first rounder. Correct, which may become relevant because I don't think Jackson's signing that tag anytime soon. And I think it'll be after the draft until there's a res- resolution. So they actually may become relevant. Where I know they're reportedly out, but theoretically they could jump back in. I'll have to go 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 down another uh, rabbit hole <laughs> in, in, in regards to that at some point with the CBA. Uh, let's see. Hello, guy. This is from uh, LV. He says, hello, guys. Great draft analysis. Highlight of my days, especially the mocks. I respect the Steelers and the way they do things, but it gets frustrating with what I consider cutesy picks, he says. He says, the Steelers are such homers with the draft. He says, would we have drafted Kenny Pickett if he wasn't from Pitt? He says, probably not. Not, not our main problem but in reality if he came from Clemson he says I doubt we drafted number two would we have drafted Connor Hayward if he wasn't Cam's brother he says I doubt it would we talk as much about Joey Porter Jr. as much as we do if he wasn't the son of Joey Joey Porter he's a decent quarterback but he's linked to the Steelers because of his dad he thinks that's silly he says and then we keep using our fifth and sixth round draft picks to trade almost back up uh, trade almost backup type players like Loudermilk and they have a huge gap between fourth and seventh round. Then starting from picks like Najee and Pat and, and instead of uh, Creed and then Buddy Johnson, Presley Harvin, and of course the pro ready Kendrick Green, he says, I'm just baffled at why and what we are doing. He says, he, we keep saying that the offensive line will finally gel get into the second season and are awful at the beginning and then gel towards the end to end when it's not an important and the cycle repeats and nothing changes other than some bargain offensive line free agents. He says, I predict this year, it's the same five guys who aren't gelling initially. And then when we are out of the playoffs, they start to gel and this conversation continues into next year. Uh, again, there's a reason we don't gel. We have no uh, first or second round uh, picks on our offense line and our very average talent at best. He says, I, I, I just don't understand the mentality of this team. It's super frustrating. Please explain. Well, I mean, I, I, it's a good argument that you put out Would they have drafted Kenny Pickett. If he wasn't from Pitt, Connor Hayward, the brother thing, the, look, the, this team's made it notorious. They like the bloodlines, plain and simple. And they like players that they think that they know the most about. And that that's what happened with, with Kenny Pickett had, had Kenny Pickett played at Clemson for, for three or four years or, you know, uh, uh, long, they would have already known a lot about it. Cause they always go to the Clemson <laughs> pro, pro days. So, uh, and then, you know, uh, Najee and Pat instead of Creed, I mean, it just seems like he's just frustrated with the overall methodology over here. I, I will say this, uh, and let's leave it at this LV. I think they've got to do a better job drafting period, top to bottom starting this year. I would just say to the first question and kind of first airing of the grievance about taking all the bloodlines and the familiar names and the good storylines. I, I understand the point, but they're not taking Kenny Pickett just simply for the proximity. It's because the information they gather by being near him, you want to try to take out as much guesswork and as many of the unknowns as possible. So whenever you have 
insight that other teams don't have that, you know, Cameron Hayward about Connor Hayward and uh, Kenny Pickett being right next door and talking to him and, and watching him, you know, over the course of four or five seasons, that special insight that kind of gives you more comfort and more knowledge that allows you to feel more confident in, in predicting and projecting a player. So um, I don't think it's that, that that terrible thing. I think it's a good thing and, and a useful thing in a lot of different ways. Um, where I'm with you, though, I don't like this team sending the fifth round picks for Malik Reed and that kind of stuff. Avery Williamson, where it provides very little to no value. And then, you know, you just lose that pick for the next draft. So I think that's been one thing this team has gotten into a, a bad habit of. Look, they got themselves in this 17th position overall, and it's it's kind of a curious one as it turns out. And what do you do with the first top three? You know, what, what many people believe is the top three tackles and the top three cornerbacks are off the off the board. And then knowing that this defensive tackle, you know, once you get past uh, uh, Carter, you know, there, there's a lot of questions once you get past Carter, quite honestly. Uh, yeah. especially when it comes to players that the Steelers are, you know, kind of, kind of look for, uh, do you run the, you know, who is the number four true tackle in this class? Who is the true number four, uh, cornerback in this class? Do you just run those cards up? Yeah, that's a question. If you want to stick with that is starting out right worth the 17th pick is Deontay Banks worth uh, the 17th pick. And those will be questions this team will have to wrestle with, uh, especially knowing they have 32 and maybe they could get a guy at 32. All right. Uh, we don't have any, we've run long, right? So we yes. probably got to get out of here uh, for sure. So keep those questions coming, bump them back up, resend them, whatever you have to do. We'll try to get to more of them on Friday. Uh, we'll see what other news we're talking about, but uh, in the meantime, thanks again for to uh, Joe Clark and Jonathan Hightrader for sitting in today uh, on, on the podcast. A lot of insight from those guys. Alex and I will be back at it again on Friday. Uh, he's got some interesting articles coming out. His defensive wish list we'll probably be talking about uh, on, on Friday there. And, uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot, follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora, follow the show at terrible podcast, email the show, the terrible podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause Steeders Depot.com, hit the donate button. Uh, also, if you like an ad free version of the site, Steeders Depot.com, hit the ad free button, up right navigational bar. Good job, Alex. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, as always, thanks for listening to the terrible podcast with Dave and Alex. 